for those joining right now, we will give um, about five minutes for everybody to join before we kick it off with the welcome session. As you can see, we are broadcasting from uh, snowy Switzerland. Actually, for those of you who can guess where my background is, I will send you a special surprise. Everybody ex uh, except Swiss citizens or Swiss natives can, can participate. You cannot, unfortunately, you cannot participate if you are Swiss. Everybody else, feel free to take a guess. And if you guess right, I I'm, I'll be glad to send you a small surprise. If you have not joined EBPF Slack channel yet, I think now is a great time to do so. We, we are trying to make this conference as interactive as possible and Slack will play a big role in that. So please join the Slack channel by going uh, to ebpf.io slash Slack to, invite, to request your invite and you will receive instructions on how to join the Slack channel. Can see lots of people joining the channel already. We're just about to uh, hit 300 members on the Slack channel. We also have a fun poll going while we we're waiting. Um, you can you can vote on your background uh, around eBPF. So what is your background with eBPF? Total newbie, just looking to learn. I use eBPF powered software. I've been known to write eBPF code and wrestle with the verifier. I work on eBPF in the Linux kernel. And what is eBPF? I'm just here for the free virtual conference t-shirt. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I see lots of votes already in. And I see Peter saying, wait, there are virtual free, t uh, there are virtual conference t-shirts. <laughs> nice. I see uh, Jorge joined. Hello, everybody. Total newbie here, looking to learn. So hopefully we can we can give you some good intro sessions. Mateus Moraes joined, newbie here, but already have Silimus Kubernetes and I on my cluster. Looking forward to learn and use cluster mesh. Awesome. I think we have a, a presentation that will cover a little bit of uh, cluster mesh details as well. I see Dimitro joined, Matthias, Michael, Deepak, newbie, though known, know the concepts and have been working in networking industry, writing fast path code for a while now. So I think you're exactly in the right place, Deepak. Alexander just joined. So those that just joined uh, the stream, make sure to also join the eBPF Slack channel. Just go to ebpfio slash slack and request your invite and that gives you the ability to uh, join the Slack channel. We will also use that for all the Q&A throughout the sessions. Ian Campbell joined, really excited to learn. I've been developing a product as an intern that uses eBPF for kernel monitoring. Really excited to see the future of eBPF and related products. Awesome. I see Brian, hello Brian, fellow CNI developer. Tim has joined, still fighting with sound. Mihai, greetings from, Do from Dublin. I started looking into eBPF BPF recently and learning about Pixie. Yeah, we have a, a, a talk on Pixie tomorrow in the lightning talk session. So make sure to, to check that out. So we're just about to get started. We have about one minute to go before we kick off the welcome session. All right, if you have not voted on the poll yet, you have to scroll up a little bit in the Slack channel. You can vote on uh, what is your background in eBPF. We'll have polls going throughout the summit in particular during the break sessions. And I think it's time to really kick it off. So it's 9.05, yes, so let's get the show going. Uh, hello and welcome to the eBPF Summit 2020. I'm super excited to welcome all of you to the first ever eBPF Summit. My name is Thomas Grave. I'm one of the co-creators of the Cilium project, uh, also CTO and co-founder of Isovalent, the company behind Cilium. And I have been involved with eBPF and the Linux kernel for many years. For today and tomorrow, uh, I will be your host for this conference. 
However, before we get started, I would like to bring something up that is very important to me. We are living in difficult times and 2020 has been rough for many, of, for many among us. Um, depending on where you are in the world, you may be currently experiencing a COVID surge. You may even be isolating. Uh, I really hope that you and your families are all safe and healthy. The least we can do in these times is to be nice to each other. We may hear a kid crying in the background or door walk into a room while a keynote is being um, delivered. And I don't even want to know how many, of, uh, how many times some of the speakers have to re-record because their kids walked into the room or a loud, loud car drove by. So yes, these are challenging times and the least we can do is be, to be uh, human with each other. We want this conference to be as inviting and safe as possible. Yes, we do have a code of conduct. We, don't, we hope that we don't have to use it. But if you experience something that makes you feel unsafe or uncomfortable, please report it and we will take immediate action. But most importantly, be nice and human to each other. I know that we all want to get started with the first keynote, but we have a couple of logistics to cover to make sure everybody is well set to enjoy the summit. First of all, you have two options to join the live stream, and I hope most of you are already on either one of them. You can join via Zoom or you can join via YouTube. There will be a slightly more lag on the YouTube side and the video quality, I think, will be slightly less. Very important, if you experience any problems, the best place to get help is the EBPF Summit Slack channel. The Slack channel is for all speaker and attendees, and you will also find members of the EBPF community ready to answer questions throughout the summit event. When we asked around uh, on challenges of virtual events, the most frequent answer was the lack of interactions and the lack of hallway track. We will be, we will be trying to make this as interactive as possible and the Slack channel will be key to that. So please join the Slack channel if you have not done so. Point your browser to ebpfio slash Slack and request an invite. We will all use that Slack channel for all Q&A, for all the talks. So if you have questions on a particular talk, ask it in the Slack channel. For keynotes, we will pick questions from the channel and then answer them live on the stream. For lightning talks, the speakers will uh, answer directly in the Slack channel. All right, before we jump in into the agenda for today, I want to provide some context on the, the content selection. We were initially expecting a couple of hundred people to show up and, and, and have this be a EBPF family event. Uh, up until today, 2,241 people have signed up for more, for more than 1,100 companies. And we have been blown away. We have received more than 60 lightning talk proposals and had to even extend the number of talk slots several times. Um, still made it very hard for us to actually come to a conclusion. And, and we had a couple of hard decisions to deny some of the talks. Eventually, we uh, ended up with 26 lightning talks and 10 keynote speakers. For the content selection, we did, we did ask all of you about your motivation as you registered for the summit. There was a ton of overall excitement, of course, um, but there were also several uh, interests that were shared specifically. For example, somebody specifically attended uh, with, by saying, I have read Brandon's book and I would like to learn more. So that one is obviously an easy one to fulfill. Uh, having Brandon give a keynote was a no brainer. And I'm super excited that he will be speaking tomorrow among many other great speakers. Based on all of this feedback, we have put this schedule together and, to and try to provide a mix of content to have something for everybody. You can see some of the other responses on, 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 on the slide here. It's definitely been amazing to all of us to see what what is exciting to people regarding eBPF? All right, naming of eBPF. I know many of you are new to eBPF and you may hear both the term eBPF and BPF at the same time. And I want to avoid confusion. So is there a difference? Technically, the more, ter the more correct term is eBPF, which stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. But many of us will simply refer to it as BPF. So it's not exactly the same, uh, it's kind of similar to how there are differences between UNCC, C90, ISO C99, and so on. For this conference, assume they mean the same thing. One last note before we look at the keynote agenda. eBPF is used for many things, and you will hear from many different community members today and tomorrow. 
The use cases cover a wide set of topics, including application profiling, tracing, networking, security, DDoS mitigation, load balancing, runtime security, network observability, and many more things. Not all speakers will cover all of these use cases. Many speakers will focus on one particular use case. That is fine and expected. Even though it may sound like speakers will be talking about different things, it's all using the same eBPF runtime. One of the most powerful aspects of the eBPF is the wide applic applicability, which allows the runtime to be shared and maintained among many, among many different people. All right, enough talking. Let's get into the agenda so we can get started. We'll start off with keynotes, uh, 15 minutes each with a five minute Q&A live on the stream after each keynote. As a quick reminder, if you have any questions for the keynote speakers, ask them in the eBPF Summit Slack channel. If you have not joined yet, simply go to eBPFIO slash Slack. To kick us off, we'll have Liz Rice, VP Open Source Engineering at Aqua, give us an introduction to eBPF programming. I think that will be a great start to the conference. Following that, we will have Daniel Borkman, one of the eBPF maintainers and kernel developer, talk about BPF as a fundamentally better networking data plane. We'll take a quick break, five minutes, so everybody can get some fresh coffee, and then continue with Tapita and Laurent from Datadog talking about their journey with eBPF. Datadog is a long-time user of eBPF and Cilium and also utilizes eBPF in their products. The last keynote of today will be given by KP Singh at Google. KP will talk about how Google uses eBPF as an LSM for security auditing and enforcement. We'll take another quick break before we jump into an amazing set of lightning talks. Then on to tomorrow, just a quick outlook, what, will, what we expect tomorrow. We'll start off with a keynote from Alexei Staravoytov. Alexei is a kernel developer as well, working at Facebook, and is the second of the two eBPF co-maintainers along with Daniel. Alexei will cover eBPF security and talk about, this, about safe programs, the foundation of eBPF. Next up, very exciting, will be Chris Noah. She will demystify eBPF for us and hopefully show us some beautiful mountain peaks in the process. We'll take a quick break and then have Brendan Gregg talk about performance wins with BPF. Brendan is working at Netflix and the author of several BPF books, as well as a longtime BPF community member. Following Brendan, we'll hear from Sang Lee. Sang is a software engineer at Google and will introduce us to Kubernetes network policy logging, one of the exciting features that was built using Cilium as Google integrated Cilium into, uh, into GKE and built a new data plane, V2. Finally, I will talk about eBPF based, or the, I will talk about the future of eBPF based networking and security. After that, we'll take a quick break before we go into the second round of lightning talks. All right, ready for the keynotes? Just one, one second, we have one more, one more thing. Look at this B. It's the eBPF logo and mascot, but it doesn't have a name yet. So we will be naming this B as part of this summit. Today we will collect name proposals and then, so you can participate in, in, in Slack. Um, you should be seeing a unnamed B hanging around in the EPF uh, Slack channel. And you can talk to the B and make proposals. And no, B Mac B face won't be accepted as one of the proposals. And then tomorrow we will, um, we will vote on the best proposals and pick the name for the B mascot for the EBPF logo. All right, that was a lot of talking. Let's get started with the first keynote. Uh, I'm very honored to introduce Liz Rice, VP of Open Source Engineering at Aqua. Many of us know Liz from amazing KubeCon and DockerCon talks. She's also been leading us through KubeCon keynote sessions. Today, Liz will be talking about a beginner's guide to eBPF programming. For security. And in this Hi, I'm Liz Rice from Aqua Security. And in this beginner's guide to eBPF programming, I'm going to be writing the eBPF equivalent of Hello World. But before we get to that, let's talk about some of the things that are happening when we run an eBPF program. 
So you probably know that eBPF lets you run your own custom code in the kernel. Normally, our application code runs in use space. And if it needs the kernel to do something, a privileged action on its behalf, then the application uses a system call to ask to make that kind of request. Normally, system calls are abstracted away. Most programming languages hide the system call interface from us. If the application wants to interact with an eBPF program, it makes sense that there is a system call, and indeed there is, and it's called BPF, that allows our user space application to communicate with the kernel about this eBPF program that we want to run. And that system call is called BPF, and we can look at the manual page to find all sorts of good information about eBPF programming. eBPF programs that are going to run in the kernel are typically written in C and then compiled into eBPF bytecode. They're quite restricted in what they can do because this, this code running in the kernel has to be safe to run. It can't crash, it can't get into an infinite loop. So it's going to get verified before it's allowed to run. Our eBPF code running in the kernel has access to some helper functions that allow us to get information about the current system. I'm going to be using uh, these functions here to trace out debugging messages and to get the current user ID. I'm also going to be using a map. So maps are data structures that we can use to communicate information between the eBPF program running in the kernel and our user space application. And the last thing we need to know is that our eBPF program is attached to some kind of event. Whenever that event happens, that triggers our eBPF program to run. You might have come across BPF trace, which is a higher level abstraction for running eBPF code. And I'm just going to use this to show you those BPF and a couple of other system calls that happen when we run eBPF code. So I'm going to take one of those examples from the BPF trace readme, and I'm going to run that doesn't really matter what this is, is doing. I'm going to use strace to look at the system calls as they're invoked. And I'm interested in the BPF system call and a couple of others. Okay. So we can see these system calls that get invoked. We can see quite a few BPF ones doing things like loading a program creating a map, so there's a few of those. And also here, we can see the system calls that are used to associate a program with an event. In this case, it's a trace point event, and it's got ID 7. Here's our program that's been loaded, and it's got ID 8. And this IO control call here associates the event 7 with that program with identifier eight, that's now going to get triggered every time that event is uh, occurs. Okay. So just recapping what we saw, we saw eBPF programs getting loaded into the kernel. We saw maps being created, and we saw how our BPF program can get associated with an event. So I think we know enough now to write our Hello World program. So I'm going to use BCC, a Python framework that makes it very easy to uh, write an eBPF program pretty quickly. And I need to do it pretty quickly because time is, is limited for this talk. And BCC, in particular, one thing it does is it takes care of the compilation for me. So I just give it my C program in the form of a, C, of, of a string here in my Python code. 
and uh, it's going to compile it for me. So, code. I'm going to write a function called hello world, and I'm going to use that helper function that we saw Oops. to print out, of course, hello world. This is C, so I have to remember my semicolons, and we return zero. So BCC takes a lot of the heavy lifting away, but I need to attach my program to an event. And I would like to trigger my program every time a new process gets created on the system. That's called a clone. And I'm going to use a, a K probe event. So K probe gets triggered when on the entry to a function in the kernel. And I need to know what the kernel function is that gets invoked when we when we clone a new process. And there's a nice way to find this, which is get the function name for a syscall. So whenever a clone syscall happens, that's going to be the name of the kernel function that gets invoked. And I can associate my well that event which is clone whenever that happens i want to invoke the function called hello world and the last thing i need to do is just make sure we trace out whatever kernel writes up here okay let's give it a try Okay, so nothing has collapsed yet, nothing bad has happened. So let's start cloning some new processes. Every time I run a program, a new process gets cloned and we can see hello world. All right, let's add something to this. How about we trace out the user ID? So whatever the user is that causes a new process to be cloned, I want that to be shown as part of my tracing up here. And there was a BPF helper function for that, get current UID, GID. Now, this is going to give me a 64-bit result. But the group ID is in the top four bytes, and the user ID is in the bottom four bytes. So two, three, four. I'm only interested in what's in the bottom four bytes. And let's trace that out. Okay. Run that. And we create some new processes. And we can see that triggered with ID 1000. Let's check what my user ID is. And it is indeed 1000. But let's do sudo, so I get a uh, sudo process is going to be invoked by my normal user, then that's going to run as root. So I should see a process with the ID zero. And indeed, that's what we see. So that's all happening as expected. Now, this uh, trace print K is it's fine for hello world but it's not good for production applications because it writes to a single pipe this reads from a single pipe that's not really going to scale if we want to run multiple ebpf programs so instead we're going to use a map bcc makes it very easy to use a map and there are lots of different types of map i'm going to use a hash table and that has key value pairs. I'm going to keep a counter of how many times each user clones a new process. So my key is going to be the user ID and the value is going to be a counter. So I'm going to create my hash table and call it clones. And 
I want a counter, which would be zero if, well, the first time, well, initialize it to zero. And I'm going to need a pointer. Okay. So we get the current user ID, and then we're going to look up in this hash table, look up the current value associated with this user ID. Now, this is actually a pointer, and before I can dereference it, I have to check that the pointer is not zero. And if it isn't zero, then we can get the counter value. If it is zero, that's because there isn't an entry yet for this user ID. So having the counter initialized to zero is appropriate. If it's non-zero, we get whatever the current value is associated with that user ID. And then we increment the counter and we update the value associated with that user ID with the new value of the counter. Okay. The other thing I need to do is change my user space code so that instead of just reading out of the trace print pipe, it accesses the data in this data structure. Again, this is something that BCC makes very easy. Um, so I don't have to write a lot of code to get those key value pairs out. This is going to loop and every two seconds it's going to print the current state of my hash table. Okay, so let's run that. And there aren't any entries to start with as expected. But if we start finding some new processes, we can see the entries and we can create an entry for the root user as well. And there it is. So we've been able to extract data from the kernel, the eBPF program running in the kernel, and see it in our user space application. So I think we should just recap what we've seen here. So our eBPF program written in C gets compiled into an object file. And that object file includes the eBPF bytecode and definition of the maps that we're gonna use. Then our user space application makes BPF system calls to load the program into the kernel and to create those maps that we're gonna use. Then, the user space code attaches that BPF program to whatever event it wants to trigger using the uh, perf event open and IO control system calls that we saw earlier. And then it can read and write to those maps using these BPF map uh, operations. I hope that gave you an insight into what it is to write an eBPF program and what's happening in both user space and in the kernel when we run eBPF programs. There's some more information on my GitHub, including a reference to a longer version of this talk that dives into a few more details. And if you have any questions, do just get in touch. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Liz. And I can see Liz as well. Hi. What an amazing presentation to kick us off and get us started into the summit. Uh, please give Liz a virtual round of applause in the Slack channel. Unfortunately, we can't hear it, but at least you can, you can see it. And also please wave in the Slack channel so everybody can see who you are to ask questions. Yeah. Let's see if questions are popping in. I can see the applause. Um, maybe to, to kick us off, uh, here's the first one for you, Liz. Um, you have been involved in, in many open source communities. From, from your perspective, what is unique about the eBPF community from a community and technology perspective? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I think, I mean, it feels to me like it's, uh, it's, 
you know, it's a low level technology. And yet it seems at least at this point in time, like a lot of people who are involved are keen to embrace people into this world. I think, you know, if we think about perhaps Linux kernel development traditionally, it has looked very scary to a lot of, you know, people outside of that community. But I think eBPF is, is moving in the right direction to be welcoming, even though it's quite hard tech. So uh, that, well done everyone who's, uh, who's getting involved. Awesome. Uh, we have one more question here. Can you su suggest some tools to debug eBPF programs? Oh, I think there's probably going to be some people who are better placed to answer that than me, like Thomas, for example. Um, the, for the experimentation that I've done, I found things like S-Trace, where I've just been trying to figure out what's going on, super useful. Um, and um, I will also shout out for a tool that my team are working on called Tracy. I think they're going to be doing a, a lightning talk on that tomorrow. But that's kind of interesting in terms of exposing some other interesting events. Um, I'm not sure that's a great answer to that particular question, but I, 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 start. <laughs> I, th I think it is. And I think we'll hear lots of lightning talks and several keynotes on other additional topics on how to debug eBPF programs as well. We had mm -hmm. one more question, which is also a bit technical, but can you dereference de null pointers in eBPF code? <laughs> good. It's yes. a good question. Yes, <laughs> you, you have to check that you're not dereferencing a null pointer. Every time you have a pointer, you have to check that it's non-null. If you try to um, load a program that that doesn't explicitly check for non-null, um, you know, which is valid C in, in the normal world, it, it would just crash, but the verifier will pre prevent that from, uh, from being loaded. So you got to do that check for non-null. Exactly. Yeah, I think we'll have Alex A go into a lot more details on the verifier and the security aspects of eBPF. I see several other questions in the same context. Is eBPF is eBPF program okay from a compliance or regulatory perspective? I think that's going into the same direction. If I write my own kernel driver that collects some profiling data, could I access the data via eBPF, via my eBPF program? Maybe that's, a, that's an interesting question. So I will, I will ask it again. If I write my own kernel driver that collects some profiling data, could I access the data via my eBPF program? I think that's, uh, so eBPF, to my understanding, and there are probably, again, people better qualified than me, but, you know, eBPF programs get access to those maps, and you're going to have to use that kind of data structure or helper functions that let you get access to other information. Um, if you have a way to get your kernel driver to insert data into that map, then go for it. Yeah. Yep. I think there's one more interesting question here, which is why, why does eBPF need root privileges? Why do you need privileges to run eBPF programs? Uh, yeah, so it needs, um, certainly CAPSIS admin is a capability that is required. I'm not sure if there is another more granular capability, but you need a privilege to load that eBPF program into the kernel. Basically, you can't call that syscall if you don't have that capability. So yeah, you yes. pretty much have to run as root or with capsis admin. Exactly. There is this unprivileged BPF mode, which is which is typically disabled. And it, 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 it is so it is possible to load programs with, without privileges, but it will be a much more restricted runtime of eBPF. And it's primarily targeted at like profiling use cases. Um, and will have much less uh, privileges in terms of what it can access from a system perspective. I think this was, again, a fantastic presentation. Again, give a round of applause to, to Liz. Thank you very much. All right. I think next up, we have Daniel Borkman. Daniel is a kernel developer at Isovaland and a member of the Cilium Core team. He has been involved in eBPF since day one and is one of the two eBPF co-maintainers. So we're very lucky to have him. Today, Daniel will talk about eBPF as a fundamentally better data plane. Everybody, please join me in welcoming Daniel Borkman. 
Welcome to my talk about BPF as a fundamentally better data plane. I'm Daniel Brockman, I work at Isovalent, and together with Alexis Starovoitov, I maintain the BPF subsystem in the Linux kernel. So let's start off with what is BPF. BPF is really a, a general purpose execution engine. It has a minimal instruction set and it was designed with two major goals. One, uh, the mapping of BPF instructions to native instructions um, really has to have a low overhead, in particular on x86 and ARM64, so that the code can be executed as fast as possible. And two, the BPF instructions, uh, they must be verifiable for safety, uh, so they cannot crash the kernel or destabilize it otherwise at the time when you load the program. And the kernel itself, it provides the uh, framework and all the building blocks, uh, for example, the BPF helpers where the BPF program can call out into the kernel, or also the attachment points where BPF program can be executed from uh, when events uh, are happening. And so the question is, is BPF a generic virtual machine? No, it's not, because it's also not the design goal. You have KVM or other things for that. Is BPF a fully generic instruction set? It's not either. So, BP, so BPF is an instruction set with the C calling convention in mind. What does it mean? The kernel is written in C and BPF basically has to efficiently interact with the kernel. Um, there are approximately 150 uh, helpers for BPF that can call kernel code and around 30 different map implementations, which is a shared storage uh, key value like storage between BPF programs and also from user space. BPF is really minimal. So it has around 114 instructions and 11 registers of which 10 are general purpose. And if you compare it to x86, it has over 2000 instructions. So it's really just um, very uh, reduced. And LVM has a BPF backend that is able to translate so-called BPF restricted C into BPF instructions. So how far off is this restricted uh, C from generic one? Um, the BBF verifier has seen major advan uh, advances in the past year or two. Uh, so with that, we are able to uh, have uh, function, real function calls in BPF. There are bounded loops, which means programs cannot loop forever, but there has to be an upper bound, which can then be enforced by the verifier. There are global variables. Uh, there's static linking. We have something that's called BTF, BPF type format, which is a um, uh, data format where you can uh, describe, uh, for example, structures or functions, and that's heavily used. And there are over 1 million BPF instructions that you can execute per program. And that really allows for solving a lot of interesting production use cases already. Um, I picked a few interesting ones uh, that may not be that obvious. Uh, for example, one of them would be to reduce the kernel's attack surface with BPF. Uh, for example, if you have a packet of dev type scenario where it can really kill the machine, uh, this, those things, they don't happen uh, frequently, luckily, um, but we had um, an occurrence in the past and I want to dive a bit into that. Um, for example, like in this case, it was about calculating packet hashes. Uh, they are used in a lot of places in the networking stack, for example, in the receive path for steering traffic between CPUs. And in case the uh, packet hash from the network card does not have enough information, um, for example, only covering uh, L3 headers, but not L4 headers, then the kernel would recalculate this hash uh, in software in order to be of higher quality. And that is, you, that is done by the so-called kernel flow dissector. It will basically parse the packet and use all of the information it can get. It will even go into an encapsulation and then derive a hash from that. And in this case, that packet of def was if there was an IP header with an invalid header length, then it would basically loop forever. And that bug was basically exposed for uh, two years and it hit production kernels. So a traditional workflow would basically look like this. You wait and like the patch gets sent to the mailing list, you wait until it hits stable kernels, then distributions backport it into their own 
kernels, then you have to test it in your environment, making sure that the kernel upgrade doesn't um, break other things. And then you have to successfully roll it out into production, uh, which also means you have to steer away uh, live traffic uh, for those nodes that you successively reboot. But in even like traditional tools like NetFilter, they could not have protected you in the meantime, since that packet hash can be uh, calculated much earlier point in the receive path than as if it would hit the NetFilter subsystem. And that, that is quite bad because it really means that all your machines are exposed and they could potentially be killed by an attacker. So BPF based workflow would have two options um, to improve that situation. One is you could drop those bogus packets right at the XDP layer with BPF. And that um, means you can attach a BPF program atomically while live traffic is flowing. And that of course means you don't have to um, wait for the distribution kernel in the meantime, you don't have to reboot or your services are not getting disrupted. And you can plan a kernel upgrade at a later point in time without extreme pressure. The other option would be like to replace the kernels flow dissector with a flow dissector written in BPF. And that is possible today. BPF programs, uh, they're here used for the packet parsing and they can be tailored uh, to the production use case that you have, which that also means that it doesn't have to have um, all the code for all the different protocols, but you can only restrict it to what you really use in production. And that also means because it's uh, BPF and it goes to the verifier and the safety check there, you don't have any out of bound uh, access to the packet, for example, or you don't have looping forever. Um, otherwise it would be rejected. And that can also be rolled out atomically without service disruption. So that's one area. Then another one is um, improving the kernel scalability and extensibility with BPF. Uh, let's take a look at the, at the cloud native example. Um, Oftentimes, uh, service load balancers are co-located uh, with regular user workloads in every node. That's, for example, the case with Kubernetes. And you can really gain a lot and reduce CPU costs significantly if you, if you move the load balancing from legacy subsystems, um, for example, NetFilter over to BPF at the XDP layer. And you can even achieve DPDK-like -like speeds with that. Um, some time ago, we did an experiment and compared uh, XDP with DBDK in terms of raw forwarding performance. And you can, you can see like uh, XDP, when you uh, push the packet out to the same uh, interface that it derived on, it even gets better performance than DBDK. So you can see like the uh, XDP reaching up to 70 million packets per second for four cores um, and DBDK uh, in comparison only 40. If you uh, send out a different NIC, um, then XDP is slightly worse than DBDK, but the, for the same NIC scenario is perfect, for example, for use cases like load balancer on the stick. And similar can be done for moving the uh, firewalling policies um, from the kernel stack down to the XDP layer. And you can then free up CPU cycles that you can otherwise spend on user, on user workloads. Uh, for example, the DDoS packet drop performance comparison, you can see DBDK is still performing uh, slightly better, but XDP has a significant uh, better performance compared to the regular kernel stack, which you can see in, the, in those two graphs below here. And look, looking at the CPU utilization, um, DBDK is uh, uh, busy pulling the NIC and if, if you compare that to the kernel stack, it basically goes into 100, almost 100% 100 software interrupt processing uh, for the regular stack here in purple. And with XDP, you can see from the orange line, you can get a much better utilization uh, because uh, you don't have to do all the work until you drop a packet. And that all happens with the upstream kernel drivers that have XDP support. <clears throat> you don't have to busy pull CPUs and there's also no user kernel boundary crossing. Uh, you can, like, given that BPF, you can reuse existing kernel infrastructure. For example, like you have those BPF helper functions that can do routing lookups, uh, just to mention one. Uh, such BPF XDP 
load balancers are implemented, for example, in a couple of projects, Catran from Facebook, Solium from, uh, from our side, and also Unimog was recently announced from Cloudflare. Uh, I've put a couple of links below here for reference. And BPF, the BPF, uh, if you have a BPF data plane, that also helps for policy enforcement or moving traffic from and to containers apart. So it's not just the north-south load balancing uh, path, but also for the containers, it will improve. Um, one example here is where you can attach BPF programs to uh, sockets so that they get executed on connect, send message, receive message, and so on, system calls. And uh, what you can do with that is, for example, implement load balancing or policy. Uh, the BPF program can then reject, for example, and throw an error to an application uh, even before crafting a network packet. And it can also rewrite uh, the actual addresses, uh, like the um, service address and port uh, that, for example, like a TCP connect call issued. And you can already rewrite it to a backend right there. And that happens before a packet got generated. So you won't have a packet based. NAT in that case. So the kernel keeps on using that backend address for the remaining lifetime of the TCP connection, which is really great. And those BPF programs, they're attached to C group B2 in this case, and this really allows for uh, fine grain policy and also scalable because you don't have all the rules in a, in, a global in, in, in a global scope in that sense, but they're just scope per pod and you only execute that for this particular pod, but not for the rest. And another area is uh, the traffic path into the pods. Um, in this example here, this is the typical example where you, the traffic arrives in the NIC and then it gets pushed up the whole stack to, for the routing, um, packet filtering, et cetera. And with BPF there on the most recent kernel, two new helpers. One is called redirect peer and the other one redirect uh, nay. Uh, and uh, that basically allows for only doing the forwarding in the, in the so-called TC BPF layer, uh, where you can then push it right into the pod. And that uh, redirect peer helper, it allows for a low latency network namespace switch uh, from the NIC into the pod for the traffic. And the other one uh, for the reverse direction, and it will automatically do the layer two resolution and populate the layer two addresses on the network packet. And this then allows to avoid the host stack. The firewalling policies you can implement in BPF anyway. And with that, the performance uh, can be significantly improved. For example, in the first bar, you see a TCP send file uh, number uh, for the node to node case, uh, basically our baseline here. And then a part to remote part case where you have the routing via stack, it only gets about half the performance. But if you, use those two helpers in combination that were recently added, you will get the native performance again. Same for the TCP request response uh, performance test. Um, numbers here are similar, like the, the pod remote podcast where you have the routing via stack is even reverse in terms of transactions per second that you can achieve. Another case uh, that is quite interesting is uh, what BPF can help with is to implement lockless rate limiting on particular on multi-queue devices uh, with a concept that's called earliest departure time. Um, in that case, the BPF program <clears throat> uh, classifies the network traffic to pods or specific applications, I mean, however you want to classify it, and then it sets a packet departure time uh, based on a, a bandwidth rate that the user defined. And Lower in the uh, TC QDisk layer, you have so-called a uh, fair queue QDisk, which can then uh, schedule this packet under this timing constraint, which means uh, the BPF program sets the timestamp and FQ ensures that the packet is not sent earlier than that. This is basically how it looks like. Uh, you have the BPF program. It does the classification and the setting of the timestamp. It goes to the multi-queue and then you have FQ leave QDisk and then it gets sent to the wire. And with that, if you compare that to the traditional approach, which would, which would be the hierarchical token bucket, which cannot be implemented lockless or multi-queue devices, you can see if you switch here to the BPF and FQ, uh, QDIS combination, then for the 99th percentile, you get a 10x uh, latency transmission reduction and 95 percentile, uh, you get up to 20x latency reduction, which is really cool. 
There are also other examples, for example, TCP congestion control algorithms that, that you can implement with BPF or custom TCP header options, which is really interesting for in particular for data centers. Uh, here I, get, I posted an example uh, where on the left side you see the implementation from BPF and on the right side you see the actual TCP cubic implementation uh, as native code in the kernel and they are very close to similar. And that allows like a short turnaround time for experimentation to develop your code and to deploy those changes. And given their safety check by the verifier, it's another great property. And also you have a stable API in contrast to kernel modules, so you don't have to deal with uh, messy upgrades. And even for the congestion control case, um, it allows to inter interoperate and extend that feedback with data you get out of you gather from other BPF programs. Uh, for example, think of um, BPF tracing programs that could influence uh, uh, those decisions or uh, programs from the TCP header options, for example. And yeah, that really overall also simplifies the control plane uh, when BPF is used in multiple subsystems because you only have to orchestrate BPF itself. There are less dependencies and, uh, and, and other moving parts. So it really feels like, so it, extended BPF has been around for six years and it really feels uh, that potential is so huge that we are still at the very beginning. How could the future look like? I mean, we see more and more functionality uh, that is moved into a BPF and in the end we may end up with a, really just a tiny core kernel with a minimal attack surface and the rest around it could be enriched through the BPF subsystem. Um, so yeah, with that I would like to thank you and um, opening up for questions. Right, thank you very much, Daniel. What a fantastic presentation. It sounds like you're working on this on a daily basis. <laughs> uh, before we go into the q and I have two quick announcements. First of all, I, I want to apologize for the abusive messages that have been posted into the Zoom chat. We have uh, banned the user from Zoom. We're working on removing the offensive uh, messages. And we have also disabled messaging on, this, on the Zoom chat. So it won't happen again. And then in terms of video quality, this, the Zoom stream seems to be varying in quality. The YouTube stream seems to be doing better at times. Just note that there might be a small delay, small lag um, from the live stream and the YouTube stream. Getting back to the Q&A for Daniel's talk, I have a first question. Um, first of all, let's give Daniel a round of applause. I completely forgot that uh, for the fantastic presentation. And then for, for my question, at what point did you realize that eBPF will change the Linux kernel forever? I mean, you have been involved with eBPF from, from, day, from day one. There must have been a, a moment where you realized this is going to change the Linux kernel for good. Yeah, it's a great question. I think uh, at the moment when uh, the BPF patch said that the, the very first one got merged, I still remember I was at the airport waiting for a plane to board. And then I saw the message from David Miller uh, that he applied the patch. And for me personally, that uh, I realized that that has such huge potential. But of course, I didn't think back then that it could change uh, the whole world like it does today. So, but back then when networking and, and tracing um, uh, really got their capabilities as they have now that really changed it. And overall, like uh, the community and the use cases and the issues they are solving with uh, EPPF that took it to a whole nother level. Excellent, yeah, I think that that's, I think my thinking around that is actually very, very similar. We have, a, we have a, another question from Tristan. You mainly discuss networks in XDP, but what is the potential for change with regards to trace points, K probes, and U probes? I think uh, um, some of the speakers, some of the other speakers, they will cover this in more detail. Uh, but basically, uh, you have an ability to introspect all the different data structures in the kernel and combine even the data that you collected from multiple trace points in, into, all, into an information feed that you then export to user space. You can customize all of this and this was not possible before. So it uh, takes the whole tracing observability 
to a new dimension. It's probably just a short answer here, but uh, there are many more uh, details from the other talks. So I would recommend to go and watch that, given we just have a few minutes. <laughs> Gavin is asking, can I play around with XDP in KVM? Uh, you can. So there, um, of course, you always have to make sure that the underlying driver supports XDP, in particular native XDP itself, uh, where they own that driver does that. Uh, but there's also generic XDP. Generic XDP, I would uh, mostly recommend for experimenting, but not necessarily yet for using in production. But a driver that has native XDP, you can definitely, uh, I would definitely recommend. And then Nick is asking, different Nick question mark, XDP can send back a packet to another Nick than it received it on. Yes, it can. So, uh, PPF programs and the XDP, they have different return codes. One of them is where you can send the packet back out the same NIC, but you, there's also an, a, another return code, which is called XDP redirect, where you can uh, send it a different NIC. So that's definitely possible. Both NICs have to support XDP natively, however. And then final question from Ching Rong Chen, can we or how, can we have multiple EPPF programs using XDP on the same host? Yes, you can. Uh, that functionality uh, was recently extended uh, to the XDP uh, and you can since qu quite more or less recent kernels, um, I would say like 5.8 or so, I would have to look it up again and uh, give you the answer in Slack. Excellent, I think we're running out of time for Q&A for this session. Daniel will stick around on the Slack channel and we'll be able to answer more questions Let's give Daniel another round, round of applause. All right, we will now go into our first break and we'll continue with the next keynote in five minutes. Uh, after the break, we will hear from Tapita and Laura talk about their journey uh, with eBPF at Datadog. So it's time for everybody to get, get a quick coffee um, and I'll see everybody in five minutes.
For those of you on the stream or who's just joined, we're currently taking a break. We will continue in about two minutes. All right, we are slowly getting back into the next set of keynotes. So find your way back to your desk or whatever you're joining the summit. We'll give everybody a couple of more seconds to settle in. If you haven't seen the, the, the poll of this break, um, there is a question, a trivia question. What does XDP stand for? Excellent diversion of packets, extended direct processing, extra super duper performance, or express data path. So take your guess. All right, uh, it's, it's time to continue with the next keynote. I'm honored to introduce our next set of keynote speakers, Tapita Sable, or Sable, I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, and Loro Bernal. Tabita is a systems security engineer and Laura is a staff engineer and also a member of the Silim core team, both work at Datadog. In this keynote, uh, Tabita and Laura will talk about using eBPF in their Kubernetes environment via Cilium, as well as utilizing eBPF for data path monitoring. Please welcome Tabita and Laura. Thank you so much, Thomas. As he says, I'm Tabitha Sable, and I'm really glad that uh, y'all have come here to join us because I wanna share with you some stories about how eBPF has helped us to push through boundaries, both like within operations and also with product development to do things safer, faster, and more easily than what we could have with traditional techniques. So I'm, I'm hoping that these will be kind of interesting stories, but also that they can encourage you to do the same things, either to be able to take you know, normal open source software and run things at bigger and more interesting scales than you could have, or to extend your own products to have new and interesting features. Hello everyone, um, my name is Laurent Bernay and I'm also very happy to be, to be here today. So first of all, for those of you who don't know Datadog, we're a SaaS-based monitoring company and we're building many products around observability. And both Tabitha and I work in the infrastructure team responsible for powering this SaaS product. And to give you an idea, we run tens of thousands of hosts and manage dozens of Kubernetes clusters, some of them pretty big. We also run on, on multiple cloud, which makes things even more challenging. So I'm, I'm going to talk about how we use eBPF in our infrastructure today. So to give you an idea, here is a very simplified diagram of our infrastructure. Um, and you can see that we run uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters on multiple cloud providers. And this comes with quite a few challenges. So the first one is since we run multiple clusters, 
we need to make sure that we can address communications between clusters. So an app in cluster A can talk to an app in cluster B. But also we need to be able to, see, to make these communications secure, of course. In order to do that, we decided from the get-go, so about more than two years ago, that every single pod in our environment would have readable IP from the underlying network. This comes with several advantages, uh, better performance, and also enables us to do a direct cross cluster communication, which means an application in cluster A can directly contact an IP from a pod in cluster B, which is often required for data stores such as Kafka or Cassandra, or for GPC communications where you want to do client side load balancing and the client need to be aware of all the backends. So these are the good things. Uh, it also comes with a few challenges. Uh, the first one is managing the IP space because of course, if, if every single pod in a large infrastructure has a unique writable IP, it means you need to be very careful in terms of choosing the network ranges you're using. And of course, if uh, having readable IPs is helpful because application in cluster A can talk to application in cluster B, then you need to solve cross-cluster service discovery, right? So the initial uh, solutions we, we used to do that was to look for CNI plugins allowing for it. Uh, on AWS, uh, we, we've been using the plugin by Lyft, which is doing exactly this, and it's been extremely helpful for us. And it was slightly easier on GCP because on GCP, you can alias IP ranges to network cards, which means you can grab IPs from these ranges for, for pods and you just have to do very simple routing on, on, on the pods themselves. Of course, as we move to other cloud providers, we would have required to find new solutions for them. Uh, an additional challenge is, as I was mentioning before, we wanted security on the network side and this solution doesn't give it and there was uh, no simple way to extend it to do encryption. If you run Kubernetes, you also know uh, that you have to do service load balancing. Um, and this is how it works in general. Uh, so you, the typical way to do that is to run kubeproxy on your nodes and kubeproxy will watch for endpoint information, uh, endpoint change in the cluster and would configure a proxy which the client will use to send traffic to pods by using a virtual IP. The default implementation uh, is IP tables and it works completely fine. So of course, IP tables is mostly well known uh, for filtering packets, but you can also use it to do some kind of load balancing and, and it works. However, when you scale and you have a large number of services and endpoints, this becomes challenging and updating the rules uh, can take seconds, like more than take seconds sometimes. And even on the data pass, going through all the rules to match the one that you're interested in can take some time. So of course, IP table comes with the kernel and it, we can use it for load balancing, but it was not designed for it. And luckily the kernel um, also has a native load balancing solution, which is called IPVS. And at some point, people realized that using IPVS as a proxy for QProxy was, was a good idea. And there was an implementation and it's very, very powerful. And we've been using that from, from the start too. So this sounds very promising, but we also faced quite a few challenges. The first one is if you're familiar with connection tracking issues, when you use IPVS, you have it two times. Once for IPVS and one for NetFilter. And IPVS has made huge progresses, but it's still lacking uh, in terms of feature parity compared to IP tables. So we had to be uh, quite involved with the community to make it work for our environment, but we've been happy with it even if we're still facing a few issues. As a summary, uh, we were facing growing pains uh, around these problems, uh, mostly because IP tables was not designed to be a load balancer, and IPVS was designed to be a load balancer, but not designed to be a client-side load balancer for Kubernetes. And as Daniel was saying before, uh, you can always improve the kernel or fix issues when you find them, but getting these fixes into your real environment can take some time. And at the beginning of the presentation, I was mentioning network policies. And of course, we could have used IP table for that, but it could make the number of rules even larger and triggering even more problems. So this gets us to eBPF, right? Because the question is, how, 
can we do programming? Uh, how can we programmically, dynamically program these features in the kernel and extend the kernel to support Kubernetes better? And here is what we, what we do today and what we plan to do in the future. So the way we currently use eBPF to power Kubernetes networking is we rely on Cilium and we use it to replace kubeproxy and solve all the problems I was mentioning before. We also use it to enforce network policies because using eBPF to do filtering is much more efficient, again, as Daniel was explaining before. Uh, Cilium also brings universal CNI, which means we can use Cilium on multiple cloud, which has been very helpful for us. And you can also use, uh, use it for host to host encryption, which is very powerful. And since uh, we're now using eBPF to power the data plane, it means we can extend it in many ways and leverage new features from Kubernetes you know, very easily. And we have ideas of things we'd be very interested in, in doing in the future, such as using eBPF to redirect traffic to sidecars or to daemon sets, or to extend support to Envoy and Endpoint Discovery Service. So far, I've mostly mentioned uh, how we leverage eBPF inside our clusters. But as you can imagine, being a SaaS product, we get a lot of traffic to our, to our infrastructure. And one of the challenges is getting traffic efficiently inside the clusters and inside our environments. And we're really thinking that uh, we should probably uh, look into using eBPF to create a smarter and more efficient network edge to do filtering, DDoS mitigation, routing, and, and maybe more. So it's very new to us. It's something we're just starting to consider, but we'll probably invest uh, some time in, into this. Like Laurent shared some of the uh, learnings and growth that we've had in infrastructure and how eBPF has had new ways of us being able to break through problems. The, the same kind of thing has happened within our products. So we have these uh, core strengths around pulling in logs, analyzing them, showing visualizations, bringing them to, bringing them to the people who need to see them. But uh, as we have grown out what we're offering and wanting to provide even more kinds of features, you get to a place where building out features using those traditional tools is very difficult. And eBPF can provide practical solutions in there too. So I want to share a couple examples from recent products. Uh, the first one that I want to share is about the security and compliance monitoring. So those core competencies that uh, you know, our, our longest standing products have been built on are generally applicable to security and compliance monitoring also. You know, the, the operational monitoring and security monitoring are cut from the same cloth in many ways, but the people who are responding to those alerts have different concerns. And so you still have the same kind of basic workflow of collecting in relevant signals, packaging them in ways that are accessible to the people who need to take care of the systems and showing them in the right place in the right time. And the use of those kinds of tools and technologies leads to features like some of the initial features in our security monitoring product, where you can define queries that are related to log events coming in and uh, you know, fire out alerts to them at the appropriate times. But uh, as we want to expand into doing more things, would we want to do file integrity monitoring based on you know, analyzing log streams out of, out of daemons that are running based on doing periodic polling from an agent? Maybe not. So to move beyond these sorts of static data collections, that you can gain new capabilities, like the ability to pay attention to transient conditions, very, very short-lived things that a polling interval may miss or you may want to be able to report on very frequent things like process starts and stops or TCP session starts and stops. And you may also want to be able to collect data from applications beyond what the developers of those applications had ever intended. And because of the power of eBPF to be able to hook into different places in kernel space, it can offer all of these sorts of things. 
of course, there's other technological solutions that could solve some of these problems. For example, we could have instead written kernel modules. But of course, shipping kernel modules is fraught. You have concerns with the user experience of installing kernel modules. Do you have to ship source code and ask users to compile them? Do you, do you try to ship pre-compiled modules for you know, every reasonable kernel? And of course, you have to worry about stability. If you crash the kernel, the whole, the whole machine comes down. Um, there are other things like uh, audit D or go audit that use the kernel auditing subsystem. But uh, you know, there's well-known struggles around the performance of that, around how to configure it appropriately. And so, and so eBPF has advantages in those two ways. And also you really, it's so versatile. You can hook almost anything with a combination of K probes, K ret probes, U robes, U probes, trace points. Um, you can really find very specific code paths that are interested in what you want to monitor and be very choosy about that data that you collect. Now, there are some limitations with eBPF generally related to the restrictions that are applied on it for the safety and performance reasons. So the code that you run in kernel space has a lot of limitations, which means that you often will want to collect in kernel space that which you must collect only in kernel space and then add other context and metadata in a user space application or on the back end. So this leads very well into building out file integrity monitoring. Of course, traditionally file integrity monitoring is done in a polling based fashion by building a database of hashes. But by using these, these, runtime, these runtime characteristics, we can say no hashes can hook at syscalls, but then also do further data processing in kernel space, like for example, hooking the open syscalls and, and its friends, but then chasing out the de-entry cache in kernel memory in order to canonicalize file paths while you're still in kernel space in order to reduce the chance of race, of race conditions related to you know, file name shenanigans, things like that. So by using this eBPF based approach to file integrity monitoring, we can take filter expressions written by the user or that we have shipped and crunch them into a form that our BPF functions want to consume out of a BPF map and load them in there. Um, you know, during this, we need to be mindful of the cost of copying from kernel space to user space and send only what we need. So then we can do something like this. We can have a simple rule and with eBPF, learn what we need to learn to be able to fire alerts when a rule like this is triggered. Another example that I'd like to get to real quick is around network performance monitoring. So using traditional tools for network performance monitoring, you're dependent on either routers or switches that can emit NetFlow data or sniffing all of the packets and therefore copying all of that data across the kernel user space boundary, which can really burn a lot of CPU in user space and also affect the latency of your actual communication that goes out the NIC. But using a hybrid approach with eBPF and traditional BPF filtering on sockets and user space enrichment, we can get a lot of these same kinds of capabilities without all of the overhead and uh, you know, performance impact of sniffing everything. So then we can combine that together by using eBPF to pull very broad data about all network activity on a host, then very fine-grained traditional BPF filters on a packet socket in order to grab particular packets, like in this DNS example, DNS packets for further processing in user space, combine it with tags and other information that the backend knows, and show it into a useful UI. And, and this is uh, where we are on our eBPF journey, and we think we're going to go farther. Um, so 
as a quick summary, as our scale increased and the sophistication of our needs uh, increased, uh, eBPF has proven to be extremely powerful for us. And the, the main advantage is you can start using eBPF with amazing open source software that is already leverage, leveraging it. And down the road, uh, you can write your own eBPF code and programs to improve your products. So we plan to continue and, and do that and develop our expertise. And, and we hope many of you will, will do it too. Thank you. Right, thank you a lot, Tabitha and Laurel. And we already have a couple of questions in, so I will start right away. Um, have you explored using vSwitch and OpenFlow over IT, IP tables before you uh, concluded on eBPF? Um, so we start from the get-go, we wanted to avoid, uh, to, to simplify the network class as much as possible under the, under the data plane. And so we wanted to avoid any kind of bridging on the, on the network side. And so we went to the simplest approach where we just do routing between ports and, and on, the, on the host, and then use the cloud provider to, to send packets across, uh, across hosts and cells. So no, we didn't have to use OpenFlow or vSwitch to do that, but it would probably be better than using a bridge, I assume. And then next question is on the security side. Do you use LSM programs for security and compliance monitoring? And do you also do active mitigation? I think that uh, the two of us are not really the best folks to answer those sorts of questions. Um, I'm. I'm aware of, of some things that I'm helping with, but I'm going to have to defer to product people. Okay. And then Liz is asking, is your file integrity monitoring published or is there a standard solution, a standard eBPF solution for this? Um, it, is, it is published. It's live in the product and uh, all of the code... Of course, if you are a, a Datadog customer, you have to run you know, the Datadog agent in order to ship all of the various things into the product. And uh, all of the code that we ever ask customers to run on their own infrastructure is open source. And so it's on GitHub in the Datadog agent repo. So yeah, it's, it's there. I'm not telling any secrets today. <laughs> And then last question we have time for, um, IP VLAN driver today does not support XCP. Are you adding hooks using eBPF or you found a way to use XDP for IP VLAN? Um, so we, we use IP VLAN uh, with the Lyft CNI plugin I was mentioning before. But now that we're standardizing on Cilium, uh, we're not using IP VLAN yet, but I think it's a feature that uh, Cilium plans to support in the future. And we'd be definitely interested in looking into it to, to have an even more efficient data path. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot again to both of you. And again, give a round of applause. What a fantastic presentation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. All right, next up is a, another keynote on the topic of security. I'm very pleased to introduce KP Singh. KP is a software engineer at Google working on kernel runtime security. KP will introduce us the eBPF Linux security module or LSM uh, on which unleashes the power of eBPF to the world of Linux runtime security. KP will talk about the motivations behind developing a eBPF-based LSM and showcase some of the ways in which it is used at Google. Please provide a warm welcome to KP Singh. Hello everyone, I'm KP Singh. I work for Google in Zurich. I'm responsible for security detection and response on Linux machines. Today we are going to talk about the background and motivation behind developing security eBPF programs or LSM programs as they're called and how you could use them to build the next generation of security products. Let's start with the story of how it all began. And just to make it a little fun, it'll be a comic. A long, long time ago, actually not that long back, 
it was in 2019 it does feel like a long time back though a security analyst came up to me and said hey i need some audit data i told them can't you just use audit they said nah audit does not have the data i need i, I think this was about audit logging environment variables So I thought to myself, how hard could it be? I patched audit in the kernel. I updated the audit CTL and the user space policy language. And before I could finish, they came up to me and said, "Hmm, I want to use this data to prevent some user actions." And reality struck. we cannot do enforcement with audit so i had to do the same thing again for linux security modules like updating the kernel and the user space components and the policy language of se linux or app armor turns out these lsms or linux security modules are not very modular after all so i told them and my boss it's easy We just need a new way to do security in Linux. And they said, "Yeah, sure. Do it." It did not take me long to realize that BPF had been solving similar problems in other areas, and it was about time to introduce BPF to security. And after extensive discussion on the kernel mailing list, another Linux security module which could be implemented at runtime using ebpf programs was born security can be broadly classified into two approaches which work hand in hand monitoring what is happening on a system and enforcement which means taking action based on the monitored data prior to ppf one could monitor using linux audit perf and trace points or build custom kernel modules with things like kprobes and enforcement could be done using linux security modules like se linux or app armor or do sandboxing using seccomp the bpf lsm sits comfortably in the middle providing a unified and flexible way to do both enforcement and monitoring so how does it work There are around 200 LSM hooks. These LSM hooks are a layer of abstraction higher than the system call API. For example, one can execute a process using execve and execve at, but they both call the same set of LSM hooks. These hooks correspond to changes in kernel objects and are placed strategically in the life cycle of the object and the ongoing operation. so that you have the right data to make the decision you need to make example actions like an inode being unlinked which is just fancy speak for a file being deleted a socket being opened or a binary executing all go via the lsm framework so the lsms can make decisions like allowing the execution of a binary or de- denying the deletion of a file The BPF LSM can happily coexist with other LSMs like SE Linux and App Armor and does not need to do anything by default. One can load an LSM eBPF program to provide to provide custom logic for the LSM hook. In this example, the BPF LSM hook for process execution gets invoked after all the other lsms this order can be changed on the kernel command line bpf programs need to be verified so that they only read valid fields of the various struct arguments and not arbitrary offsets into the context pointer modern kernels have btf information which is a condensed form of two of information and has information about the structures and the respective runtime offsets of the of its members and the signature of the functions that are defined in the kernel 
Using this information, the verifier is able to check whether the accesses that are made in the BPF program are allowed because it knows the signature of the LSM hook and the types of its arguments. The verified program is then just in time compiled to native code and from this time onwards, it is no different from another LSM hook. This LSM hook can then write audit data back to user space using ring buffers and maps and also make enforcement decisions. Show me the code. <laughs> Let's have a look at an eBPF program that audits process executions. The first step is to define a struct or the data format which will be used by eBPF program and also by user space. We attach the eBPF program to the LSM hook called PPRM committed creds. Although this hook is terribly named, it signifies a key state during the execution of a process. Let's talk a bit about that BPF brogue macro. The BPF programs typically get a single pointer as their context. For example, this could be a socket pointer for networking programs, but there is no single pointer for tracing an LSM programs that can be used as a context. So the programs are invoked with an array of integer pointers, which contain the arguments that are passed to the attached function. The BPF brogue macro simplifies the definition of these programs by deconstructing or unmarshalling this array into these respective arguments. The next step is to reserve some space on the BPF ring buffer for the data that needs to be shown or written to user space. One can now call BPF helpers to get the information and thanks to BTF also read some information directly passed uh, to, the, uh, to the arguments. In this case, we read the current PID using a BPF helper. Finally, the event is submitted to user space. The user space can then use the poll API to process this data further. LSM programs can also be used to do stateful detections by annotating kernel objects using security blobs, which are made available to BPF programs as BPF local storage. The LSM blobs allocated have the same life cycle as the owning object, and are freed with the object, which makes it easier to maintain than conventional BPF maps. In this example, a security blob is set on the task struct with a pointer to the inode of the executable. The information can then be used in the inode unlink LSM hook, which is called when a file is being deleted, to check whether an executable is trying to delete itself. The LSM program can then choose to deny this action or log an event to user space as a warning. One can further set security blobs as a part of a more complicated multi-state detection. Let's have a quick look at the code. Do note that this is based on my upcoming patch series for task local storage, but works similarly for the already available inode and socket local storage. This defines the task storage map with an element of type struct local storage, which contains the pointer to the inode of the executable. The map is merely used as a key to identify the program setting the storage, its type and the size. The actual storage is still owned by the object that is the task struct and not by this map. We then set the storage on the BPRM committed creds LSM hook. Note that we are reading directly from struct BPRM here. This is possible thanks to BTF. We then retrieve the storage from the current task and compare the value of the inode to that being, to that being deleted and return a permission error when they are the same. Again, a slight warning here. The BPF get current task BTF is also a part of my task local storage path series. Let's have a look at some of the recent updates and the upcoming features relevant for LSM programs. A new BPF ring buffer was merged into the kernel to overcome some of the limitations of the perf ring buffer, 
we found this very useful for LSM BPF programs. The patches for BPF D path helper have been merged. This helper can be used to get the path of a directory entry from a BPF program. This means that you can get the path of the binary being executed or the file being deleted or opened. We already have task locals. We already have local storage for inodes and sockets, and the patches for task security blobs or local storage should be on the list soon. Hopefully, they will be already on the list by the time you hear hear this presentation. Some of the LSM hooks need to read user memory. The most notable and notorious example of this is reading the arguments of a process. Since the data can be paged out. The BPF programs may need to sleep in order for the kernel to paste the data in. Prior to sleepable BPF, this was not possible. Thanks to the work done by Alexei and Paul McKenney, it is now possible to do this in sleepable versions of LSM and tracing programs with the BPF copy from user helper. Loading LF LSM programs at boot time. This is helpful when you want the Task, local storage to be set on kernel objects really early on in the boot time. The support for this has also been merged with the user mode helper BPF programs. Atomic operations. My colleague Brendan is working on adding atomic operations to the BPF instruction set to implement operations starting with the atomic fetch and add instruction. Advanced string helpers to, to handle data like argument vectors and file paths. We've not started work on this yet. We need more helpers to process the strings that we can now gather with the BPF dpath helper and the sleepable BPF. At Google, we use custom patches to dump process arguments onto the ring buffer, but these need to be generalized. So there is, there is some work to be done here. Some final thoughts. Our vision is to emp empower the security analysts to leverage the years of research done on LSM hooks and implement detections and auditing using eBPF without needing to worry about patching the kernel or rebooting the whole Linux fleet. I do think that BPF LSM won't replace more advanced LSMs like SE Linux or App Armor, at least in the near future but it will happily coexist with other LSMs and learn from them. Thank you so much for listening. And now it's time for questions. Thank you, KP. And we, also, we already have several questions popping in. To kick it off, I actually really like the, the comment from Miles, KP bringing the fire to his boss. <laughs> that, that, very funny. Uh, first question is from Roberto. Can LSM BPF delay instead of denying the deletion of a file? In other words, can it block the process calling the unlink signal? So the, as of now, I don't think so. Uh, I do think that one could add a BPF helper that just delays the execution of uh, in, in the BPF, uh, you could add a delay. We haven't thought of that use case, but we could discuss it more on the on the mailing list or or in the Slack channels as well. Okay. Then Yonif is asking, are there any new eBPF helpers to extract data from the LSM hooks arguments? Uh, extract full five, for example, extract full five file path from the file struct without parsing the kernel structures. Uh, I think this is what I what I mentioned in the talk as well that we have the BPF D path helper and thanks to Jiri uh, who's done some awesome work here. We need to enable it for some of the LSM hooks. Uh, there, I think I'll be sending a patch. Uh, I or Flora will be sending a patch very soon. But they're already available for tracing and we just need to send a couple of lines of change which enables it for KRSI or PPF LSM. By the way, I don't talk that slow that I talked in the presentation normally. So I'm a bit fast uh, when I talk generally. Sorry for the mismatch. <laughs> I think it was actually very, very easy to understand that way. John is asking, what is a good way or place to get started with KRSI? So this is an interesting question. What we realized is the, the ramp up going into BPF is pretty hard. Uh, 
we do have the EPPF site that helps a lot. But we also doing, uh, and this is like really work in progress, but there is a project on GitHub we've started, which has some documentation on how you could start with LSM programs and how you could gather data. I will post the link in the chat. But again, this was an intern's work over us over the over summer, and we would encourage actually some uh, a build build up on that project, and we'd also be contributing actively there. So the goal is like if you don't know anything about KRSI or VPF LSM, how could you build a user space application uh, and and deploy it on your system? And then Gavin is asking, as of today, to load eBPF programs at boot time, can you just load them via a systemd unit? I, I'm, I'm not sure of uh, I'm not sure of that. Maybe you could do that in the system D as well. But sometimes you actually want it to be done even before that, because what you're doing is you're setting these annotations of blobs on kernel objects, and then you want to do it as early as possible in the boot process. So this new BPF user mode helper stuff that was added uh, actually enables uh, that use case. If the system D is early enough for you, I think you should be able to do that in system D as well. Excellent. Then Tristan is asking, do these LSM BPF programs still need a user space program to keep them alive? So last I checked, no, you can pin BPF programs and you can keep them alive by pinning them on BPFFS. So we, we actually had this use case as well. So thanks to somebody who implemented it. And then the last question before we run out of time, Swarm is asking, can LSM hooks be theoretically used to monitor modification of user space memory from BPF programs. It's a method that can be used to create a stager for, mal for malware. I think it's an interesting use case. I, I, I don't know whether that is possible. Maybe some, uh, some complicated memory hashing scheme where you could read memory hashing. FS Verity, but that is not really user space memory. I, I can't think of something on the top of my head that would answer this. Okay. But go. Please feel free to extend stuff and send us patches. <laughs> yeah, I think definitely a very interesting idea. So again, KP, thanks a lot for a fantastic talk. Please give a big round of applause to KP. And this was the last uh, keynote. This was the last keynote yeah. of day one. Personally, I've been blown away by how many awesome talks we already had. Uh, next up, we will be going into the lightning talks, which will be five minutes each, but we will do a uh, short break before we do this. It's uh, 43, we will start at, um, at 50, so in seven minutes. Have a nice break, everybody. Grab some coffee and then be back for the lightning talks. Talk to you in a bit. Uh, I, I, I now see what KP is saying, wanted to, to, uh, wanted to announce. We have uh, just created an eBPF LSM channel. So for those of you who are interested in this topic, there is a new channel on the eBPF Slack, on this Slack. The channel name is eBPF-LSM. So if you are interested in KRSI, if you're interested in eBPF uh, runtime security, please join that channel and you can participate in the eBPF community related to runtime security and an eBPF-based LSM.
Hello, if you are on the live stream and you just joined, we're currently taking a break. We will continue in about three minutes. In the meantime, we have a new poll going on in the Slack channel. Which one of these use cases is not covered by a existing eBPF program type? In brackets, yet. Tracing an other eBPF program by attaching to its entry point or customizing the battery charging behavior <laughs> or decoding IR infrared protocols, filtering right access to sys control knobs or re-implementing their kernel TCP congestion algorithms. Make sure to vote in the eBPF Summit Slack channel. We will continue in two minutes. All right, we're slowly getting back out of the break. We will continue in about one minute. People are still joining the Slack channel, which is awesome. I also really appreciate everybody giving lots of applause to the speakers. If you, if you have not been there from the beginning, we're actually running um, a, a, a small task to name the eBPF mascot, the, the logo. So there is a uh, Slack user called BPF unnamed with a little B icon. You can talk to that Slack user um, and make proposals on how to name the eBPF B mascot. With that said, we are getting out of the break and we will be starting the lightning talk sessions. Um, unlike the keynotes, the, the lightning talks will be five minutes each, and we will be holding the Q&A directly in the Slack channel. So feel free to just shoot the messages into the Slack channel and the speakers will uh, answer them directly. Uh, this will, we, have also, we have also asked all the speakers to pre-record the lightning talks simply to minimize disruptions during handovers um, and to minimize um, the overall time it will take. All right, so let's get started with the first one. Um, I'm excited to introduce Bryce Kale from Datadog. Bryce will be talking about how and when you should measure CPU overhead of a eBPF program. Welcome to how and when you should measure CPU overhead of eBPF programs. I'm Bryce Kale, a software engineer on the network performance monitoring team at Datadog. So why should you profile eBPF programs? Even though runtime is often measured in nanoseconds or microseconds, eBPF programs can be in the critical path of your system. If you're writing socket or packet processing programs, the overhead can affect individual packet latency and overall network throughput. Uh, Cloudflare presented a case at the Linux Plumbers Conference where by reducing overhead by 80 nanoseconds, they saved one minute of computi computation time per second during a large DDoS attack. At Datadog, we mostly are tracing programs, but because they're installed on thousands of customer machines, we need to minimize our system resource usage. One way we tackle this is by tracking program overhead variants during our CI, as you can see here. So let's talk about some of the tools you can use to get profiling data. The first one is built into the kernel. It is kernel.bpf stats enabled. It is a sys control that was added in 5.1, but it is off by default. It turns on stats collection for all eBPF programs. You cannot pick and choose which ones you wish to measure. And it exposes a total runtime and run count uh, since you turned on stats collection. This makes it good for benchmarking and CI CD use cases. 
And also it could be used in a sampling profiler in production. The reason you would want a sampling profiler is that it adds about 20 nanoseconds of overhead per run. And that's because it makes two calls to sketch clock here to get the start and end times. So there's two ways to enable this. One is with the syscontrol CLI, the other is by writing directly to procfs. And there's three ways to access those kernel stats. The easiest way is with BPF tool prog show. It exposes runtime NS and run count there, as you can see. Second way is by using the BPF syscall with BPF obj get info by FD. And the third way is if you know the file descriptor number of your BPF program, you can read it directly from procfs. There is an additional way to enable stats that was added in 5.8. This is a file descriptor based alternative to the syscontrol. And the reason it was added is it allows multiple concurrent profilers to run and it doesn't turn off profiling until the last file descriptor is closed. So another tool that you can use to read uh, profiling information is BPF tool prog profile. This was added in 5.7. It uses hardware perf counters and because of that, it has some different metrics available. There are cycles, instructions, L1 cache data loads, and L1 cache misses. This makes it really useful for more in-depth profiling. Um, and then the last program is BPF tool prog, prog run or the BPF prog test run command to the BPF syscall. So this was added in 4.12, but it's only for specific program types, mostly those that do packet processing. Uh, you do get to specify how many times you want the program to run and you get to control input data in context and then read output data in context. This makes it really good for unit testing of your packet manipulation programs. You can send it a very specific packet and read its output. And it's also good for debugging. If you're having a particular uh, type of problem with a specific packet format, you can directly test your programs that way. These are the list of programs that are supported for BPF prog run. And all of them support most of the features except for XDP. And lastly, I wanna talk about eBPF Bench, which is a Go library I wrote for benchmarking from Go, uh, eBPF programs from Go. So it augments the standard testing.b object. You register the file descriptor of your eBPF, eBPF programs, and then you get output results in the standard Go benchmarking format, which allows you to use it with tools like Benchstat. So to demonstrate this, I want to use a very simple program. It's a K-probe that does nothing. And then we'll add another program, which is the same, but it adds a helper, BPF helper call. As you can see on the right, we can see directly the overhead that the helper call has added of about 60 to 7, 70 nanoseconds per operation. And that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bryce. Uh, wonderful, oh, that was a nice animation. How wonderful that you can profile BPPF programs while, you, while they're profiling other applications. If you have questions for Bryce, um, please ask him in the BPF Summit channel. He will answer them in directly in the Slack channel. Next up is Brandon Cook. Brandon Cook is from Adobe and Brandon will talk about eBPF at Adobe. Hey everyone, I'm Brandon. I'm a senior platform engineer at Adobe and I'm gonna to talk to you about our use of BPF. Um, so I lead the network engineering team for our internal PaaS. Um, we deal with all aspects of static and dynamic networking, um, help design our cloud agnostic uh, architecture. Day-to-day, um, -day, often troubleshooting broken, slow, or otherwise sad networking. Uh, my team does not deal with happy traffic. Uh, and then when we're not doing that, we're engineering the future. Um, we have over 23,000 employees, which is, you know, has, has its challenges. It's a pretty big company, uh, and manage quite a lot of infrastructure, um, across cloud and data center. Um, and we also have pretty significant compliance requirements. The one affecting me the most is separation of duties. Uh, you know, I can't, it's not like in a startup where you just uh, own and run all the infrastructure and can SSH into a box. Um, so I don't get to do that. Uh, and then also workload isolation, which uh, I'll, talk, I'll talk about. Uh, so really two uses, uses of BPF uh, indirectly via Cilium, but also a project I started called BPF Insights. 
Uh, so Vestilium uh, gives us, you know, network isolation of uh, tenants on our multi-tenant clusters. We use L3 through L7 policy, um, and then uh, selectively open up that policy to allow like service to service communication within a cluster. Um, <clears throat> the XDB filtering uh, has been great. Uh, you know, it's something we, we could have written, but didn't want to and found it in Cilium. So I was uh, being able to, to drop traffic, you know, in the NIC or um, very, very shortly after in the kernel is, is a huge win. Um, and then no more coup proxy uh, that got rid of um, tens of thousands of IP tables rules. Uh, so that was great. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to the Cilium team, you know, not only for what they've built, but for how they've been to work with. I've always been met with humility and professionalism, and I just really appreciate that. Um, so BPF Insights, um, this is a lightweight, always on, runs everywhere, kernel level visibility. Um, you know, we looked at things like like B, BCC and um, BPF Trace, and uh, they just you know, they're, they're, they're good tools. They just weren't what we needed for, for what I had in mind for uh, getting this level of always on visibility. Uh, you know, that's uh, also running very lightweight. Um, you know, this, this quote, obtaining insights into low level networking. I mean, it really comes out of, uh, you know, scars from war rooms, uh, you know, uh, with, you know, maybe a service team or two and an operations team or two, um, trying to debug, you know, low level issues um, and not having, uh, you know, much worse if there's not a reliable repro. Uh, and so that's really uh, what this project is, is trying to avoid. Um, you know, if you have to take a packet capture across uh, 100 nodes, um, you're in a pretty, pretty bad spot. Um, not that that hasn't been done. Um, so here's a blog post about some of the, some of the foundations of this project. Um, you know, really a lot of the, the frameworks um, and tools that are out there, you know, they're building on BPF, um, but already because they're, they're frameworks or tools, you know, they're coming with opinions and, and trying to make things easier, which is great, but um, it just wasn't what we needed. So uh, I, I, this is some, some hard won knowledge um, to uh, do BPF from the bottom up. Uh, so this consists of uh, K Pro BPF programs, um, things like TCP collapse, which uh, doing what I do, I certainly want to know about um, a user space C program uh, to communicate with those those BPF programs. Um, obviously, via maps, um, and then a Go program that binds to the user space program via CGO, uh, which um, and that the, the the two and three there combine to make a single component. Um, so you know, at the at the kernel level, you know, you get like a PID. Um, and so it's important to contextualize that um, with uh, what we can glean from the process in a, in a universal way um, and try to pull things out like pod name and stuff like that and start to contextualize uh, the PID. Um, and then, you know, log interesting events uh, like uh, how long it's taken active openers to establish a connection um, and then expose a metrics endpoint uh, for Prometheus to scrape. Um, and that is it. So I'll be happy to take questions on Slack now. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brandon. What a fantastic presentation. I, I learned a lot about BPF Insight. Fantastic to see and, and I think a great example showcasing that BPF is not just about, or from a networking perspective, is not just about the forwarding and policy aspect, but also enables completely new visibility and observability opportunities. And definitely also want to give the shout out back to the Adobe team. It has been fantastic to work with you guys as we continue to shape the future of eBPF based networking. Next up is Andreas Gerstmeier using BCC and BPF Trace with Performance Copilot. Andreas is uh, from Red Hat. Hello, everyone. My name is Andreas Gerstmeier and I'm a software engineer working in performance tools at Red Hat. Today, I will show you how to integrate BCC and BPF Trace tools into a Performance Copilot. Performance Copilot is a system performance analysis toolkit with a wide range of metrics. It supports logging, alerting, visualization with Grafana, and much more. BCC is the ePPF compiler collection, and it makes it easier to write 
um, the prepare tools, and it also has a great integration with Python. Prepare trace is a high level tracing language for ePPF. Performance Copilot supports multiple agents, where each agent is responsible for gathering metrics of one specific domain. For example, we have one agent gathering metrics from the Linux PocFS file system, another one gathering metrics from the PostgreSQL database, and one for PCC and one for PPF trace. Each metric has multiple metadata associated with it, for example, a semantics, whether it's a counter value or an instant, the unit if it's bytes or kilobytes per second, type and instances. For example, the device throughput metric has one instance for each hard drive. Let's take a look at the code. Each PCC tool consists of two parts, the ePPF code and the Python code. Here we see the biolatency PCC tool, which um, um, collects the latency of each block IO request and shows it in a histogram. Here we have one ePPF map storing the start of each block IO, block IO request. And here we have the histogram. And now let's take a look at the Python code. Um, here we have the PCP metric name. It will be pcc.disk.all.latency constructor. Here we have the metric definition. We are storing the values as an unsigned 64-bit integer. It's a counter metric and it has microseconds. So for his storing histograms, we are making use of the instances functionality of PCP. So each bucket of the histogram will be one instance. Here we compile it and let's take a look how it, um, yeah, how the data will be in PCP. So we can query the data with PM info minus F PCC dot disk dot latency. And here we have each bucket, for example, 16, 16 microseconds until 31 microseconds. And this is the counter value. We can also see it in uh, Grafana. We can see uh, each bucket and the bucket values. And we also have integration for BPF trace. The BPF trace integration is conceptually much simpler. You just need to write the BPF trace script, store it in a directory, and then the PCP integration will pass it for variables, for example, the at start and at microseconds, and it will automatically export them as um, PCP metrics. We can see them, we can see all the exported metrics in PM info, PPF trace, scripts, bio latency. Here we have some control metrics, for example, the bit of the PPF trace script. And here we have the um, metrics of this histogram. We can query it with that means minus f, and we again see the um, buckets and the counter values. We also can um, see the um, BPF trace script output as an histogram in Grafana. We open the BPF trace dashboard, and this is the block IO latency. Here we can see. It looks the same as the um, PCC one. And you can see the buckets and the count, how many, um, how many values were in this specific range. I hope you enjoyed the talk and you will have a lot of questions in the Q&A and Slack. Bye. Thank you very much, Andreas. If you have questions for Andreas, please ask them in the Slack channel. Then this has been a perfect example for practical uses of eBPF-based profiling and monitoring. Our next lightning talk will be Bradley Whitfield from Capital One. Bradley will talk about building a secure and maintainable SaaS. 
Hello, my name is Brad Whitfield. I'm a platform engineer at Capital One, and today I'll be talking to you about building a secure and maintainable PaaS leveraging eBPF. So my team built an internal platform as a service called Dragon. The goal is to make it so developers can ship code to production with as little friction as possible. And we had great success with this in one division of the commercial bank. <clears throat> we had hundreds of pods and dozens of nodes, but we wanted to bring this to more teams within commercial. And, but we couldn't make it a multi-tenant platform as is, so we gathered a list of requirement, and here's a subset that relate to this talk. So network security and auditing, of course, we're a bank, so everything is security first. And we had to come up, or we had to have a way to audit the network traffic down to the specific application that initiated the connection. So we also needed to be able to scale and maintain this solution because we were growing in scope, but we were not growing in teams. So we were trying to avoid adding any infrastructure or code that we had to maintain. And if we added tools, we wanted good troubleshooting abilities with them as well. So ultimately that led us to evaluating eBPF-based container network interface offerings. So IP tables has its limits. In theory, eBPF can scale a lot better. And we saw examples of writing programs that hook into eBPF, such as with Tracy from Aqua. <clears throat> so we landed on using Cilium for our CNI. And it was gaining a lot of adoption and support. And it met our list of requirements for CNI, such as supporting network policies. And it has a lot of other cool features, such as IPsec between nodes, cluster mesh, and more flexible network policies. So several of us from Capital One went to KubeCon 2019. And there we saw Hubble from Isovalent, who are the folks that support Cilium. And they announced at the start of KubeCon this tool called Hubble. And since it was using Cilium, we had to check it out. So very briefly, Hubble is a platform built on top of Cilium and eBPF. It runs as a daemon set on the cluster. And it provides us with the networking and security observability out of box. So we did not have to write custom code. So ultimately, we landed on, the, on this solution using Hubble and Cilium Enterprise for our multi-tenant clusters because it added very little maintenance and performance overhead, and it met the list of requirements we outlined earlier. <clears throat> so let's dive into some of the benefits of Cilium that you can see here. Uh, reduced IP tables is a pretty noticeable one. If you've ever logged into a node and run IP tables-s when it's a Kubernetes node with some pods on it, you'll know that the list is normally much longer than this. But this is a default Cilium installation. The list really doesn't get longer than this. With Cilium network policies, we get some additional benefits that Kubernetes network policies don't allow out of box, such as filtering on layer seven. So on the far left, you can see that we're filtering based on the HTTP protocol. And we also allow outbound to specific DNS names rather than IP ciders or a rotating list of IPs. And we can also apply network policies at the cluster level rather than the namespace level. And with the Cilium CLI, we get additional commands that help us troubleshoot network policies because sometimes they're hard to get right. So you can see that we can list all the endpoints on a given node. And then similar to TCP dump, we can actually watch the traffic and then see if it's denied by policy like you see in the top right there. So, and then let's dive into some of the Hubble benefits that you see here. So durable audit log storage, um, you can think of, or you can use any of your cloud provider storage, such as S3, Google Cloud Storage, or Azure Blob Store for durable storage. And then integration with your enterprise seam, right? Such as Splunk, Logarithm, or Sumo Logic. And then we also get this really cool command with Hubble called the Hubble Observe, where we can do similar to the Cilium Monitor command, but now we get more flags that we can use for our filters, such as filtering on labels rather than just IDs. And then we can filter on drop traffic like you see there, or we can just follow all the traffic on a node or for a given pod and watch it in real time. Uh, we can also make this network visibility available for teams, right? The Hubble UI shows this really cool service map where you can see a loud curl is talking to Nginx, but bad curl is not. And then if we filter by denied traffic there, you can see that it's because it's being dropped and denied. <laughs> Uh, we also get the ability to make these logs searchable for teams, and we can even use Hubble FGS to see the binary that's initiating the call. And you could see here that even though I have curl in the pod name, I'm actually using wkit. But this can be used to see if like a container was exploited, for for instance, or if maybe someone just used a kubectl exec. So all of this is eBPF powered, right? So we've been able to successfully bring this platform to more teams other than Commercial Bank. And now we do hundreds of deployments a day and we have clusters that have thousands of pods. So this stack has allowed us to provide less friction to even more and more teams while using modern technology to meet our security and regulatory requirements. Thank you, Brad. How, how charming and excellent it is to see how 
uh, values created in the open source communities translate into financial industry security requirements. If you have questions for Brett, please ask them in the Slack channel and also please give Brad a round of applause for a fantastic lightning talk. Our next presenter on the lightning talk session is Lorenzo Fontana uh, from Cystic. Lorenzo will be talking about debugging the eBPF virtual machine. Hi everybody, thanks for coming to listen to debugging the eBPF virtual machine. I'm Lorenzo Fontana and today I'm going to talk to you about just very basic things that I understood while working on ABPF programs that I want to share with everyone. Debugging is a very useful technique that everyone uses uh, to just understand how program is behaving. It can also be used with the BPF by just putting together two concepts. The BPF succeeds only if it's in the kernel and the kernel can be debugged using GDB. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we understand we need, you know, just a couple more things than normally. Uh, we need a kernel image, a root file system, and a BPF program that doesn't work, of course, if not, we can go to the redebugging, and GTP. To get the kernel image, you just, you know, uh, download the kernel and compile it. The important thing is that you need to enable the um, debugging symbols under kernel lacking compile options. And we need a root FS. I just use build root, important, uh, it must be XT4 and have networking and SSHD SSH so that we can use uh, it to copy files into and start things. Uh, once the kernel is compiled, root FS is compiled, we can just start the VM with chemo and just expose SSH port as needed. Once that is started, we can try to load our BPF program. I created a simple BPF program for, for this, uh, which is uh, faulty and we don't know in which way yet. And um, also loader for it so that it just loads a program and makes it work. This program will be, is already uh, copied in the machine uh, because I prepared it. Oh, no, it went away. Great. I can copy it in the machine after compiling it, I already compiled it. And now I can start it. Um, just doesn't work. How do I debug this? I went a bit ahead and started, you know, understanding where the red points are and everything is because I don't have much time in this session. But it's important to notice that it's just, you know, putting breakpoints in the kernel um, and going ahead until you find the actual point where you are having the problem. Um, I can connect the GDB session by, uh, well, this is not wrong, this is the wrong directory, kernel Linux, GDB, VM Linux. I can just, at this point, um, use a remote target. So target remote localhost one two three four, which is one that I already started, and by you know uh, doing trial and error with the debugger, I noticed that I have to put our final breakpoint ring buff uh, C one five nine, and continue. Once that is done, I can just try and start the program and it will hit the breakpoint. It actually hit the breakpoint in this place. And as you might remember, we had an error 22, which corresponds to inval. And in this function, there are only two invals. And this is the second one. And this one is the actual one because after looking at the code, we immediately noticed which was the error in my program which is that I basically put um, max entries that is not the power of two. So just putting in 4096 is going to work. Um, uh, Clang program SCP. I might just need to stop this and continue here and maybe quit so that I don't stop anything. And here I can just copy the program again. And now A out doesn't work yet. So I probably did a mistake. 
Oh yeah, I need to copy the program too. All right, now it works. I can start any binary and it just show me the thing. Now back to slides. Um, another way to do the same thing is by using verbose and just putting it in your um, in your code in the kernel instead of you know putting wrap points and that's everything thank you thank you very much lorenzo i think as you get down into the weeds of debugging ebpf that definitely wonderful to see how you can how you can get around problems like this for those of you who are completely new to ebpf you don't have to go that deep right away there's various higher level projects that will help you leverage ebpf um, without getting into the weeds of writing C code, BCC, BPF trace, Cilium, Falco, and so on. They will all abstract this away. So this was definitely a presentation more on the developer side. So just not to make sure that we're not scaring off all the, all the new um, people learning about eBPF. All right, thanks a lot again, Lorenzo. Give an applause to Lorenzo. Next up is Jen Lin from ARM, and Jen Lin will talk about enabling eBPF superpowers on ARM64 with Cilium. Hi, I'm Jenny from ARM, open source software team. In this talk, I'm going to summarize what we have done with enabling Cilium on ARM64 and what we are going to do in the future. Cilium is a container networking solution based on eBPF. This page lists part of the Cilium user. We can find the heavyweight player, such as Google Cloud, Adobe, Alibaba Cloud. So exciting for Cilium communities and all Cilium contributors that Cilium be accepted by major cloud provider. This slide lists the container networking solution that our team has taken part in. In the ARM ecosystem, Selenium is an indispensable part of our cloud native. So we are excited to start the journey of Selenium ARM64 support in January of this year. The work we have done so far, including fixed compiling and the running runtime issues on ARM64, enable multi-arc support for Docker image, Add uh, Amazon 4 jobs for Travis. Multiple unitized case future issue occurred on Amazon 4 platform. However, after investigation, it is found that most of the issues are code defect, not related to the Amazon 4 architecture. About the Travis, Selim also the early adopter our ARM64 Gravation 2 with the 4 VM. The job will be rooted to AWS environment. The, that make ARM64 um, job more stable than our XT container and also more efficient than AMD64 job. As you can see from the screenshot, the ARM64 job is completed three minutes earlier than AMD64. About the dog image, all preparations are in place, such as dog file and mac file. Communities using dog BDX to create a multi arc image. That is a quite simple way. The job running on GitHub Action. But the ARM64 image has not been released yet because an important component. Selenium proxy encountered one issue during the cross compilation and uh, has not been resolved. The community is working hard to solve this issue. I believe that the M64 image will meet with you soon. Please be patient. I use the workaround method to build the image. So let's take a look at the situation of Selenium on M64 in advance. Here, here is a simple demo on um, Ampere server. I created a cluster without a Gubi proxy and then using the Helm to install Selenium as a CNI plugin with the eBPF Gubi proxy replacement. 
in order to validate the setup, we deploy index port. Now we check the index port are up and running. Next, we run the CDM command to check the service list. Curl test so connectivities for cluster IP. And also so connectivities our node port in another host. Absolutely no applicable rules for service in represent. Yeah, Stellium made work do well on ARM server. About the future work, we have to do Stellium benchmark on ARM64, enable E2E -E testing. Now the test framework involve Vagrant to create a VM to run the test, not suitable for ARM. This is the Slack channel to discuss ARM64 support into Stellium. If you have any commands, you can discuss here. Hope to listen your voice. Thanks for your listening. Thank you a lot, Chin Lin. I definitely never get tired of seeing an empty list of IP tables rules. Always exciting or still exciting to me. Also, thanks a lot for the ARM community uh, with working with us to enable Selim on ARM64. Next up in the set of lightning speakers is Beatrice Martinez. Beatrice is working at Isovalent and she will talk about zero instrumentation monitoring with your first steps in eBPF. Hello everyone, my name is Beatrice and during this session, I will be sharing two different approaches to getting started writing eBPF programs. In order to be monitoring from which location an application is consumed, we will need to instrument it or configure an external service. We are going to see today how we can do it without making any changes at all by using an eBBF program. Running in the kernel, we get the source IPs from the request to a specific port, write those into an eBBF map, and that can be accessed from a Golan user space application. And using UIP, we'll get the locations from the IPs and paint the points in the map. Starting with our eBBF program in C, we will compile it with Clang. Then, in this case, we are going to use TC to load it. The verifier will ensure that it's safe and the program is always going to exit. And then the code will be just in time compiled to the underlying CPU architecture. Our program will be running event-driven every time a new packet arrives to the TC control ingress. Let's see the code. We define our port 8083, and then we have the section to define the ADPF map. This is the type of the map and the pinning will determine the options to how the maps file descriptor is going to be exported via the file system. This will allow us then access from the colon side. In this section, we will define the program and our function is going to be getting as context all the, all the packet metadata. We are going to be reading from the ethernet to the IP to the TCP layers until we get and locate the TCP port. If this port is 8083, we get the source address and write it in the stroke that we have defined over here. The last step could be to use this helper function to push the event in the data source map. Once that we have the program, let's compile it using Clang. And now we are going to use TC to specify in the VP object that we just get and the relevant section that we have named before. And that could be all we can now move to the Golan side. In Golan, we can access the ABPF map data with this path, and we are going to read the events and send those into this Golan tunnel. From the Golan side, we will be reading those requests and process those, getting the country from its IP and then updating some counters that we need to represent the map, loading those in JSON format that we are going to be serving. Over here, as you can see in the static index, we are going to use this data to represent the map. That will be all. Now we can run our Go application. We are going to access our port 8083 several times from our um, PM in the States and also a few times from 
um, my browser. I'm located in Spain. And now we could be able to access the map and see both locations, these states and Spain. Let's go back to the next example. We are going to use now a different approach. EDPF programs can be attached to different events, K-Probs, trace points, network packets, and in this case, we'll be attaching ours to UProbs event from the user space. In this example, we'll be having the same simple application that allow us to receive a word in the HTTP GET request. We'll be tracing the Go function that receives that word as argument. We'll be using, in this case, GoBPF, which use BCC underlying and provide Go functions, making it more simple, the flow of compiling, loading, and attaching the program. Let's see the example. We have already run in our simple applications and we can send in the HTTP request any words that we would like, like um, EDPF. And we'll be having this function printing the word out there. This is the one that we are going to be tracing. First thing that we see is that we have our C code um, as a constant in a string. And the second would be how we are going to add that state. So every time that uh, this function is executed, given that we have attached to this uprof event, we can execute our function over here that get as context a pointer from which we need to calculate the offset to start reading the arguments. Once that we have those, we are going to use this EDPF map to submit those events. We are going to be reading it from the goal side using this channel. And the only thing we are going to do now is uh, print the word. So let's see how we are going to submit a new word now. Um, summit. And we will get it over here from EVPF side. As conclusions, EVPF programs are event driven and those events can be every time a new packet arrives or every time a function in a user space application is executed. There are frameworks available that make it a lot of easier and we've been able to monitor an application we are having to instrument it. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Beatrice. It's wonderful to see how easy it is to get your first eBPF program going using the eBPF Go library that we published earlier. It's the same Go library that uh, Solim is using as well in order to control the eBPF aspects of, uh, of Solim. Let's give a round of applause to Beatrice for a well done uh, lightning talk. Next up is Javier Honduvela Cotto from Facebook talking about RBPerf, understanding Ruby with BPF. Hi, my name is Javier and I work as a production engineer at Facebook London. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about RBPerf, a new Ruby profiler written in BPF. The first question you might be asking is, why use BPF to write profilers? The main answer is flexibility. The core piece of a profiler is the stack walking code. By writing this code in BPF, it is very easy to build several types of tools. For example, on CPU profilers to understand what are the CPU hotspots of your application, off CPU profilers to know what's causing your program to be descheduled from the CPU, or memory leak detectors, among many other types. The overhead is low thanks to running in kernel space and the BPF JIT is also very beneficial. We don't have to send signals to the tracee or disturb the Ruby VM's normal execution path in any way. All this allows for continuous profiling in production, which is a super useful thing to have. The usual workflow most developers have when they suspect there is a performance regression is to try reproducing it in their dev environment or run some profiler in production, hoping that the overhead won't be too high and that the issue will still be there when they are looking at it. Most of the time, the application needs to be modified and restarted, which makes some investigations harder. A better approach is to continuously profile your application in production. This way, we will be able to catch this type of issues earlier and improve your end user experience as soon as possible. Lastly, RBPerf doesn't require any code modification in the tracee. So your app doesn't need to be restarted or redeployed. 
Ruby is a dynamic programming language popular for writing web applications. It has several implementations. RubyPerf is able to understand the most widely used flavor, C Ruby. Let's go through some of the examples and see what RubyPerf can do for us. It can, for example, help you with performance troubleshooting, thanks to CPU profiling. But it can also trace some events, such as system calls. The interface might be familiar, as it's inspired by Perf, the common Linux profiler. Here we can see two commands, record to generate an on CPU profile and serialize it to disk, and report to read a saved profile and generate a flame graph. This is a CPU profile of a Hello World Rails app, a popular web framework. As you can see, these tags are quite deep. We will discuss this in a bit, as it introduces some interesting challenges. The example here is very similar, but we are interested in knowing which Ruby code is calling the right system call. So how does RubyPerf work from a high level perspective? The main component is a PPF code that knows how to walk Ruby stacks in memory. The driver program provides some information that the stack walking code needs and understands the output from said program which then saves to disk. The way Ruby stack frames are organized in memory is a C Ruby implementation detail. It is not standardized, and we relied on GDB helpers that the Ruby developers kindly provide. Supporting several Ruby versions means that we need to account for small differences between them, such as some structs offset changing or something that used to be an array that now became a pointer. Something we took early into account, it's correctness. How do you test a profiler? Fortunately, thanks to train spoil tracing, we can have simple Ruby programs that, for example, invoke some system calls while we trace for them. So we can verify that the resulting stack trace is the one we expect. Some BPF safety features, such as bounded loops and limited number of instructions can result in the profiler not being able to fetch the whole stack trace. By using a mix of BPF tail calls, modern kernels, and some messy code, we can traverse more frames. Fortunately, we always know if the stack is complete or not. Our reperf is in experimental status. There is more work to do, but some of the main things I would like to do in the open source version are to rewrite the driver, to allow for a single statically built binary, improve the documentation, open source some of the bits and bobs that were left out and add support for request-oriented workloads. That's it. Thank you very much. Feel free to ask any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Javier. Javier will be available in the Slack channel for questions. We will continue with Pablo Moncada uh, from MassMobile. MassMobile is a telco in Spain, I think the fourth largest and Pablo will be talking about scaling a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster in a telco. Hi, my name is Pablo Moncada, and I work as a software engineer at Group Mass Mobile. And I'm going to share with you how we are scaling a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster. Mass Mobile is the fourth telecom provider in Spain and provide voice and broadband services to more than 12 million customers. There are seven different brands in the group and more than 800 in total. This can translate into high complexity level of underlying systems. We are around 150 software engineers. This is what we are building. This is what we call mass stack, which is a set of highly decoupled subsystems each of them with different business logic. This stack works on top of the telecom network elements and all business logic is implemented here. For example, the billing system must be able to process real-time charging with millisecond accuracy and the authentication system must provide fast and reliable mechanisms for both customers and systems. We heavily rely on infrastructure to orchestrate all our systems. Such a complex system must be easy to operate. With Kubernetes, we can reduce operational complexity 
we are able to deploy new systems and versions several times a day. We ensure availability of our services and scalability of our applications in a cost-effective way. With Istio, we can observe everything is happening in the mess. Implement and user authentication, mutual TLS for a cluster application, and improve the reliability of applications by automatically retrying failure requests or implementing canary deployments. Kafka is the spine of our communication stack between services and also fits the data warehouse for analytics. Implementing our stack in a single Kubernetes cluster reduces operational complexity. Infrastructure is managed by a small team of three engineers. It helps us to reduce cost as we are able to efficiently allocate resources and serve control and monitoring planes. A multi tenant cluster introduces new security challenges where no application can be trusted and we need mechanisms to enforce security measures. As you can see, our cluster is not very big, but also it is not small. Although there has been an exponential growth and we need to pay attention on future scalability issues. This is how Cilium can help us resolving our security and scalability challenges. It can act as a cube proxy replacement with more than 2,000 services, we can start watching performance issues with Kube proxy. Network policies allow us to restrict connectivity inside and outside a cluster. For debugging and compliance terms, login is a feature we must have. Also, Thelium is the only CNI that introduces DNS-aware network policies and we can create policies based on a full qualified domain name rather than IP addresses. Multi-region availability can be achieved by using Cilium's multi-cluster feature, where we can maintain our multi-tenant topology and act as a single cluster. When talking about Istio, Cilium can provide increased security by protecting compromised side cards as they are not subject to Istio's security rules, or by enforcing application traffic to go through the sidecar proxy. Observability is one of the main reasons why we are using Istio, but for external services using TLS, we are completely blind. Cilium can provide us visibility and allow us inspecting HTTP headers, and we will know how third-party services are behaving Managing Kafka ACLs, it's hard when there are hundreds of them. With Cilium, it's possible to configure policies the Kubernetes way, using labels that apply to several workloads at the same time. As you can see, Cilium, based on eBBF technology, absolutely helped us on the journey to the cloud native. Thanks for watching. Awesome, thank you very much. Pablo, awesome to see that Solim is is widely used not just in the in the financial sector but telcos as well. Uh, and again, another example of a Q proxy replacement. There's definitely a theme that we may have done something right by replacing IP tables. Next up is Jakub from Cloudflare, and Jakub will be talking about steering connections to sockets with BPF socket lookup hook. Hello everyone, my name is Jakub and I'll show you how to steer connections to sockets with BPF socket lookup hook. So who am I? I work at Cloudflare while I help build reverse proxies and maintain the internal kernel. I also contribute to the network stack and BPF subsystem in Linux. So our goal for today is to deploy an echo service that will respond on three different ports but use just one TCP listening socket. We'll need a VM with at least 5.9 kernel, a BPF tool for that kernel version, as well as libbpf and kernel headers. This is going to be a speed run, so instructions and code for everything I show will be also on GitHub. First, uh, we need an echo server. 
netcat that spawns the cat tool will do. Uh, we bind our server to quad seven port on loopback. And next we check our VM's external IP and confirm that the host service is not running on the ports we want yet. So uh, now we are going to program the socket lookup. Uh, what is socket lookup? Well, it is a stage of the receive path in the network stack where the L4 protocol searches for a socket to accept an incoming packet. We'll attach a BPF program to the socket lookup. That program will examine an incoming packet metadata and check if the packet is destined to one of the EHO service ports. If so, it will dispatch it to the EHO server socket. So let's take a look at our BPF program. First, we need to define the two maps, one to keep a list of open ports and another to store the listening socket. Then the body of our program in which we check if the health service is configured on the packet's destination port. If so, we grab the health server listening socket and dispatch the packet to that socket. Now that the program is ready, we have to build it. And once built, we can load it into the kernel and pin it onto BPF file system for easier access. Notice that the BPF tool has already created the maps that the program is using. We need to make these maps accessible to the unprivileged user who owns the EHO service process, in this case, Vagrant. That's why it will pin these maps on a dedicated BPF file system where the user will be able to open them. So now it's time to put the EHO service listening socket into the BPF map. First, recall that our server is running and the SS tool will show the PID and the file descriptor number of the socket. To put uh, the socket in the map, we need to get a duplicate file descriptor for that socket. And there are a few ways to do it, but if we know the process and the file descriptor number, PIDFD getfd system call will be the easiest one to use. So let's uh, run a helper program that uh, does just that. It gets a duplicate file descriptor for the socket using pidfd getfd and inserts it into the EHO socket BPF map. Now, if we dump the map context, we see that the socket has been stored. What's left is to put our BPF program in action by attaching it. Sockets live inside the network namespace, and so we attach the EHO dispatch program to a network namespace by creating a BPF link to it. Next, we also need to configure the dispatch program. For that, we populate the echo ports map that drives the dispatch program by inserting the three port numbers where we want the service to be available into the map. Well, all should be set well. If, if we risk and the ports on the VM, the port numbers we have just enabled appear as open. And we can also test the echo service on each of the ports we have opened up. It works. So if you want to use BPF socket lookup, there is documentation, tests that can serve as examples, as well as blogs and presentations from earlier work. Also, please watch out for a follow-up blog post on the Cloudflare blog, where we will also talk about UDP services. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome presentation, Jakub. Always great to hear from you guys on the Cloudflare blog and you're participating in a lot of eBPF communities. So definitely uh, watch out for that blog post coming up. Next in the list is Manali Shukla. She's from Cisco and Manali will be talking about hardware breakpoints uh, implementation in BCC. Very exciting. Hi folks, I'm Manali. I work as a software engineer in Cisco. As part of today's talk, I'll be talking about hardware breakpoint and its implementation in BCC and how we can use this, implement, this functionality via BCC interface. 
So I would like to start this presentation with a small introduction to hardware breakpoint for the people who haven't used it before, and then we can go ahead with the implementation details. Hardware breakpoint is called memory watch point, and it is used in Petris system calls and user and kernel space debuggers. We all come across with memory corruption related bugs in uh, for many times in our lifetimes, and these bugs are really tricky to uh, to resolve because the cause of the error would have happened long before the system starts showing the symptoms. Hardware breakpoint is an answer to such memory corruption related bugs uh, to monitor the memory access. Hardware breakpoint functionality is already implemented for PERP. I have shown it in my slide that how it can be used. Mem colon ADDR, where ADDR is a memory address uh, on which we want to break in and access is a type of memory access like read or write. Now, if you want to profile read write accesses for a particular address, you can do it in a way it is shown in the slide. Now let's look at the hardware breakpoint infra in little bit more detail. Hardware breakpoint infra uses hardware breakpoint registers. The main job of hardware breakpoint register is to raise an exception whenever a monitor location is accessed. Debug registers treat all break breakpoints in the same way, but there is a fundamental difference in a way in which hardware software breakpoint requests are effected. A user space breakpoint belonging to only one thread will be active on only one processor as shown in the figure. On the other hand, kernel space breakpoints will be active on, on, on the all the processors uh, because kernel code can run on any processor at any time. Because of this, kernel space request to register and unregister breakpoints to the processors will be done through IPI as shown in figure. Registration and unregistration of hardware breakpoint for user space or kernel space is done using register user hardware breakpoint or register wide hardware breakpoint. Now let's look at the implementation details. As part of this implementation, we are creating a B, uh, interface called BPF attached breakpoint in libbpf, which is internally going to call perf event open system call. But before calling perf event open system call, we are setting perf event attributes like uh, perf type, which is perf type breakpoint for us, then B, uh, and BP length and BP address is uh, which is symbol address, etc. We are going to call perf event open on all the CPUs. That is why we are calling check on each CPU for all the CPUs. Now let's look at one example where uh, this functionality is uh, used to monitor memory access. Here in this example, attached BPF breakpoint is called with symbol address PID func and BP type as parameters. In the in func BPF map is at, uh, map is created, which is used to store PID process name, user stack ID, kernel stack ID. So whenever symbol address is accessed, uh, all of this data will be stored in BPF map, which can be uh, accessed in user space. This way we will know who accesses this address and what was getting executed before this access uh, address was being ex uh, accessed, which is really helpful in debugging. Now, as explained in the previous slide, output of breakpoint.py will look like this. Here, we, we are fetching feedbacks address from KOL sims and then uh, we are passing it as a parameter to attach breakpoint. So whenever PIDMAC ad PIDMAX address is getting accessed using sysctl, um, we can see the we can see kernel stack and user stack in the output as shown in the second box. The 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 same example can also be tested for user space addresses. This is uh, this is what we have done till now, and uh, these are uh, the items in our to do list. The the this implementation is under review, and we are planning to do some design improvements based on the suggestions we have received. With the current implementation, required symbol address can be uh, retrieved from KOL sims manually. So we are trying to figure out a way to do it in in the implementation itself. 
that is all from my side i'll be happy to take up any questions or suggestions thank you thank you very much monali please direct any questions regarding this talk to the slack channel cho has already created a threat next up is sam white sam white is working for gitlab and sam will share with us uh, securing kubernetes clusters with this DevSecOps and GitLab. Hi, I'm Sam White with GitLab, and I'm excited to show you how GitLab can help protect your Kubernetes clusters from attacks through integrations with Cilium and Falco. Cilium provides basic firewalling capabilities, and Falco provides intrusion detection capabilities. Together, they provide defense in depth by protecting both the network and the containers from attack. For this demo, I have a GitLab instance on the screen on the left and a terminal in Kubernetes on my right. Today, I'm limiting my scope to just the open source capabilities that we have that also leverage eBPF. So this GitLab instance you see is actually running our core product with functionality that's all free and open source. To get started, the first step is to connect a Kubernetes cluster to your GitLab instance. For this demo, I have already connected an existing cluster that I set up ahead of time with a basic Nginx ingress. I've also created two projects in GitLab. The cluster management project will be used to hold the configuration for installing Cilium and Falco, and the simple web app project will be used to deploy a basic web application into Kubernetes and to configure any namespace specific policies. To install Cilium and Falco, all I need to do is come back to open the cluster I've connected and select my cluster management project as responsible for managing my Kubernetes cluster. Going back to that cluster management project, you'll notice I have a GitLab CI YAML file in the repository that's running GitLab's default managed cluster application CI job. To install Cilium and Falco, I just edit config.yaml file in the GitLab slash managed apps folder and set the installed variables for Cilium and Falco to true. Once I commit the file into my repository, GitLab will automatically run a pipeline job to do the installation. And you can see the installation happening here in GKE. Once the installation is complete, you will notice that both Cilium and Falco are now running in the GitLab managed apps namespace. By default, GitLab deploys Cilium in audit mode to allow you to observe the effects of policies before you begin enforcing them. To switch Cilium into blocking or enforcing mode, you can create a Cilium folder with the settings to put it in blocking mode in a values.yamls file. The pipeline will automatically run when you commit the edits, and once it's complete, Cilium will have been set to block traffic. As a final installation step, I'm going to run a command to restart any pods in GKE that were running before Cilium was installed so they will recognize Cilium as their network manager. Now that I have Cilium and Falco set up, let's take a look at the simple web app that I deployed to production. We can visit the website and see everything is up and running. Unfortunately, this web application has a very serious remote code execution vulnerability where the text that is entered is allowed to run directly inside the container. For example, I can append commands to list the files in my current directory. I can read the system hosts file, and I can even write to it as well. As you can see, I was able to append a new entry to the end of the file. Finally, when I try to reach a container in another namespace, you'll notice I get a 200 response code, showing that I have full network connectivity to everything else in the same cluster. Fortunately, I'm able to lock this container down through GitLab by leveraging Cilium and Falco. Cilium network policies work based on an allow list model. If at least one policy applies to a pod, then it will block all traffic that does not match their policies. To block the undesired outbound traffic to other pods, I can go to my project, add a new network policy to the auto deploy values.yaml file that will instruct Cilium to only allow traffic to this namespace if it's inbound from the Kubernetes ingress node. I'm going to do this for both my master branch and my database branch, so it will apply to the applications in both namespaces. Again, after my pipeline finishes running, we can go back to our vulnerable web application and notice request now times out when trying to connect to the other namespace. Similarly, I can set up Falco to monitor for unauthorized reads and writes to the file system. Falco rules are configured at the cluster level, so their configuration is done inside the cluster management project. I'm going to create a new Falco folder and enter my rules inside the values.yaml file. This one is going to monitor for any write activity to files inside the containers. Once I commit the file, the pipeline job will push the new rule into Kubernetes. And now when I try again to write the, to the host's file, I can see the activity is being recorded in the Falco logs. It's worth noting that although I'm not covering blocking in this talk, GitLab does have the ability to block these kinds of actions. 
and can also export the logs out to an external system. In managing Selenium and Falco through GitLab, users gain the ability to manage, store, and audit their policies in the same way they manage, store, and audit their code. This means it comes with a full audit log of any edits made, as well as the ability to revert back to a previous version of a policy at any time. Thanks for your time today. I hope this demonstration was useful to you. It makes managing your policies and rules a little bit easier. Thanks, Sam, for this great presentation on and demonstration on how Falco and Solium together complement each other and improve security using eBPF. Of course, all of what uh, Sam demonstrated from a security perspective is obviously also available just using Falco and, and Solium directly. Uh, GitLab provides the automation on top. Next up, our last talk for today on the Lightning session is Xonlu Traffic Control the rapid MQ with Rust using Red BPF. Hello, everyone. In this talk, we will see how to use Rust and BPF to analyze a layer 7 protocol such as AMQP and use BPF maps to conditionally drop some packets in order to protect the backend service. My name is Lo Xun, and I work as a software engineer at CCP Games. My job involves managing our RabbitMQ cluster. RabbitMQ is a message bus service. It speaks the AMQP protocol. We had a production incident caused by a faulty client, which created tens of thousands of AMQP consumers, and that quickly exhausted RabbitMQ's memory, rendering the entire service unavailable. We need to find a way to prevent this, for example, by limiting how many consumers are allowed. But adding such a feature in RabbitMQ will be a long process. Instead, we can use BPF to do it outside of the application. The idea is to build a BPF limiter program to track how many consumers have been declared by each connection. Once the limit is hit, the limiter program will tell the kernel to drop further consumer declared packets. While well, most other frameworks require C for BPF program, Red BPF allows you to write Rust for both the BPF and the user space program. Why use Rust instead of C? Well, let's not start a language war right now. At the end of the day, I simply love writing Rust. Anyway, Red BPF already supports XDP and socket filter programs. However, seems neither would work for this use case. After some searching, I found that the Linux traffic control or TC subsystem can actually drop packets and it can also use BPF program to make such decisions. All we need to do is make Red BPF able to generate such programs, which turns out to be relatively easy. In fact, all BPF programs are the same. That is to say, they use the same set of instructions. So it's really the input and output that defines the type of a BPF program. TC programs take the same input as socket filter. You can see the full change in the linked PR. With the PR merged, we can just use this TC action to mark a normal Rust function. And Red BPF will do its magic to build a BPF program out of your Rust code. In the program, we first use information in various network protocol headers to limit what packets we need to look at. We also extract the source IP and port for later use. Then we need to parse a little bit of the AMQP protocol. After reading several documents, we parse these few bytes to find out basic consume and basic cancel methods. Here is the core limiter program. We use the map as a counter for consumers per connection. We increase the counter when declaring a consumer, decrease it when we cancel one. And finally, if the count exceeds 10, we drop the declare packets. And that's pretty much it for the BPF program. Let's see whether it works. Here on the left, you can see a test application that tries to declare 11 consumers. Before we attach our limiter program, you can see that the client is able to declare all the consumers. Red BPF makes it very easy to compile BPF programs, but currently we still need a few workarounds, which are wrapped by the cargo make command here. TC commands can look quite complex, but the Selenium documentation explains it very well. And that's what we are using here. Now try the test application again. We can see it cannot declare the 11th consumer. We have indeed succeed. 
To wrap up, I want to compare the BPF solution with implementing such feature inside the application itself. In my opinion, BPF programs can be developed and deployed very quickly. We have a lot of confidence because of the kernel verifier. The downside is that we need to track application states manually, and sometimes it can cause unintended behavior. But I still think for cases like this to prevent misuse and guarantee service uptime, sacrificing a single application is a worthy trade-off while we wait for such safety mechanisms to be implemented inside the application. With the Red BPF project, next goal is to support other program types and hopefully make it an attractive alternative to BCC and other C-based BPF compilers. I'd also encourage everyone to give Red BPF a try and contribute if you can. That's it for my talk. Thanks, everyone. You can find the project on GitHub and contact me via email or Twitter. Thank you very much, Xan. This was wonderful. I was not aware of this. It definitely a lot I learned. Definitely check out this project, Red BPF. And this concludes the, the lightning session for today. I'm honestly blown away. So much effort has gone into this by all of the speakers. Uh, this has been truly amazing. Uh, I hope you have been enjoying this as much as I have. Before we go into the closing comments of day one, I would like to thank all of the speakers. Uh, the content so far has been absolutely amazing, I think, and I'm sure we will continue on the same level tomorrow. I would also like to thank everybody for helping organizing things in the background. I have been doing a lot of the talking and most I've been the most visible, but we had a lot of people work behind the scenes all day to help make the summit a reality. Give them a round of emoji applause as well, please. Uh, before we preview the agenda of tomorrow, for those of you who have been new to eBPF, it's likely that you still have a lot of questions. You will have heard a lot of uh, details today on various levels of complexity. Some are, some are higher level introductions. And then for some of the talks, we've been diving into lots and lots of details. One of the best resources to get started with links is eBPF.io or specifically eBPF.io slash what is eBPF. It contains lots of links and pointers to guides, documentation, and tutorials, and also has a list of all the major eBPF projects which are built on top of eBPF. So you don't necessarily need to write eBPF programs yourself. We've heard several examples throughout the day with Falco, Cystic, uh, Falco, Cilium, BCC, BPF Trace, and so on, of projects leveraging eBPF and providing a higher level abstraction on top. Then as you dig further, you will also find lots of um, additional documentation to get into the weeds of eBPF to learn about instruction set and so on. All of this you can find on eBPF.io. Before we finish off for today, a quick look at tomorrow's agenda. We'll start with a keynote from Alexei Starovoitov. Alexei is a kernel developer working at Facebook and also the second BPF co-maintainer. Alexei will cover eBPF security and talk about safe programs, the foundation of eBPF. Next up will be Chris Nova. Chris actually let me know throughout the summit today that she might be changing her talk title for tomorrow. So it will be a surprise, but I'm sure it will be fantastic. We'll take a quick break and then have Brendan Gregg talk about eBPF uh, performance, uh, getting started uh, to get to performance wins. Uh, Brandon is obviously a well-known book author on eBPF and a long-term eBPF community member. Following Brandon, we'll hear from Sang Lee. Uh, Sang Lee is working at Google and she will introduce us to the topic of Kubernetes network policy logging, one of the exciting features that uh, were brought and introduced into Cilium as part of the data plane V2, the new networking data plane based on eBPF and Cilium for GKE. And finally, I will conclude with the last keynote on eBPF-based networking uh, or the future of eBPF-based networking and security. After the keynotes, we'll host a second round of lightning talks in the same way as we've done today. With all of this said, I hope you had a wonderful, great first day at the eBPF Summit. Uh, again, I would like to thank all the speakers. And with this, we will conclude day number one. I hope to see all of you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific. See you tomorrow. <laughs>